What's up guys, this is your favorite fanfic YouTuber, the fanfic majesty, and welcome to another amazing video. You can follow me on Patreon for exclusive stories. 3SHW The Bharati I enter Johnny and Yosaku, the bounty hunter duo and Sanji the cook. No one's pov two days have passed since our pirate crew of four set sail on their ship, the going merry, and thus two days have gone by since their training began. Do you all know what the key is to true progress? Luffy asked his crew, on the third morning of their voyage since they left Sura village. They were all in the kitchen, just finished with breakfast, when their captain sprung the unexpected question on them. After a few moments of thought the three gave their own takes on the matter. Relentless training. Zoro answered with absolute conviction, already taking a meditation pose in the corner of the room to begin observation hockey training. A proper night's sleep and a healthy diet. Nami answered as she began stretching from where she sat, the telltale signs of muscle growth shown in each flex of muscle in her lithe body. No rest for the wicked. Usopp answered half-heartedly, bags under his eyes as he wobbled unsteadily like a freshly reanimated corpse. Well, Nami's the closest, I think. Luffy said eventually after taking a moment to sweat drop seeing Usopp's zombie-esque appearance. The full answer is break days, otherwise known as cheat days. Cheat days? Zoro repeated, staring at his captain incredulously. Nami and Usopp however froze before they cheered and ran off before Luffy said something like, psych. Don't worry Zoro. If you want to keep training you can, it is your hobby after all, and yes I'll be available for a sparring session later this afternoon. Luffy responded, placating his swordsman's ire. While you and I do find training as an engaging and even relaxing hobby, Nami and Usopp have other interests. Better let them get days of leisure and recreation to look forward to after intense training marathons. Zoro nodded, accepting his captain's answer before beginning his observation hockey training. Luffy, pleased with his vice captain's dedication to achieving his goal, cracked a smile as he left Zoro to meditate in peace. Well, now what do I do? Luffy pondered as he walked around aimless on his ship. Nami should be finishing up her maps in her room, so I should probably not bother her. Zoro, well, he's obviously sticking to our usual training regimen. Usopp, yeah, let's see what Usopp's up to. Having come to that conclusion, Luffy set out to find his marksman, and find him he did, on the balcony in the backside of the ship, lugging around a box of cannonballs. Mind telling me what you plan on sinking with those? Luffy asked with a quirked eyebrow. Come, oh, I remembered coming across a cannon down in the storage room and thought I might take it out for a spin. Usopp answered excitedly before he suddenly mellowed down a bit. If uh, if that's all right with you, Captain? Luffy stared blankly at Usopp for a few moments, resulting in the marksman building up a nervous sweat before sighing and grinning in relief as his captain's face formed an ear-splitting smile. No problems here, Usopp. Luffy said before looking to the sides to see if there was anything to target, stopping his search on a lone rock formation quite a few clicks away. Why don't we see if your aim with a cannon is as good as you were with your bow and slingshot? Usopp nodded with a confident smile as he pointed the cannon towards the rock formation, pausing briefly before making minor adjustments. Taking into account the winds and the distance, I angled it a bit higher and towards the right to compensate. It should hit the rock formation right in its center from where it starts to rise from the ocean to its peak. Usopp explained upon noticing his captain's questioning look. Luffy reached into his pocket and brought out a lighter, flicking it open and testing to see if it's still lit, before passing it over to Usopp. Well what are you waiting for? Let's get this show on the road. Not needing to be told twice, Usopp lit the fuse and let the cannonball fly. To his and Luffy's delight, the projectile hit the rock formation dead center. Whistle, you're definitely Yasuf's son. Ha 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 ha. Thanks Luffy, Usopp crossed his arms as he leaned against the railing, suffocating arrogance rolling off the sniper in waves. You know, this reminds of the time I blah blah blah. Not interested in hearing another one of the hundreds of tall tales his sniper cooks up, Luffy just nods absentmindedly, making sure to make surprised looks on his face for added effect. Usopp didn't notice and just soaked up his captain's, genuine, admiration. Looking away from the sniper, Luffy turned up to admire the jolly roger he had Usopp make based on his admittedly poor sketch. A wolf's head wearing a straw hat and crossbones was painted and raised proudly on the Going Mary's mainsail and the pirate flag flapping in the ocean breeze. The sniper did shut up the moment Luffy's eyes narrowed and snapped to look towards the front of the ship. In a flash Usopp had his bow drawn and an arrow notched as he cautiously made his way towards the deck. One hostile, Usopp asked his captain as he sensed someone boarding the ship. Your observation hockey's taking shape. Yeah there's one, keep your weapons out but don't fire. Luffy commanded as he walked to the edge of the balcony just in time to see a tanned man with jet black hair, tattoos on the left side of his face with the meaning, see, and dark blue glasses come aboard wielding a sword. They're agitated but, they're more distressed, worried than outright aggressive. Come out, you damn pirates. The aggravated newcomer screamed as he kicked a few empty barrels, breaking them. Hum. Zoro opened his eyes, breaking his meditation. That voice. Can I help you with anything? Luffy called out to the man as he looked down on him, his coat flapping behind him, flowing with the cold ocean winds. Are you nameless pirate wannabes trying to kill my partner? The man cried in outrage, his facial veins pulsing violently as he raised his blade to take a swing at Luffy, who he singled out as the captain, ignoring the marksman with an arrow notched at him. That was his mistake. Thunk. The blunt arrow hit the newcomer straight on the head, disorienting him long enough for Usopp to jump down and knock him off his feet. Planting his foot on the intruder's chest he notched an arrow, a lethal one this time, and aimed straight for his brain. 
I don't know who you are but you aren't harming this ship. Usopp growled firmly. L lost by a hair, the intruder said under his breath through grid teeth. Johnny? Zoro asked in surprise upon seeing the familiar face after walking out the kitchen. Old friend, Zoro, Luffy inquired not taking his eyes off the downed man being held at gunpoint, arrow point. Something like that, Zoro answered as the intruder groaned in pain tilting his head to get a better look at the swordsman. Be big bro Zoro, Johnny shouted in surprise, pushing Usopp's foot away as he jumped up to his feet, the archer letting him stand but still keeping his lethal projectile aimed true. Why are you on a pirate ship like this? Where's Yosaku? Aren't you too glued at the hip? Zoro questioned, ignoring Johnny's question. Ah, he's right here, big bro Zoro. Johnny said running to the side of the ship, Zoro and Luffy walking to his side as Usopp walked over to Nami and briefed her on what was happening as she walked out her work room wondering what all the noise was about. Why Yosaku is? Zoro sweat nervously seeing his old pal bleeding on the small ship that had been tied to the going merry via grappling hooks. The vice captain put a hand on Johnny's shoulder as the raven-haired man's face cascaded with tears. Bring him aboard, we'll treat him the best we can, Luffy said giving his first order to Zoro, before turning to face Usopp and Nami grimly. Grab one of the spare beds down in storage as well as our first aid kit. We've got an injured man so get to it, now. Realizing this wasn't their friend but their captain speaking, all three crew members rushed to carry out their orders, Luffy jumping down with Zoro to carry Yosaku up to the going Mary. Yosaku was a man of average height with a long green coat, black shirt, red headgear, brown boots, and blue striped yellow shorts. His torso was wrapped in bloody bandages and streaks of blood escaped both his mouth and nose. Upon further examination, once Yosaku had been placed on the spare bed on the going Mary's deck, Luffy noticed his discolored skin. He's sick. Yeah, although a few days ago he was so full of life, he just became like this so suddenly. Johnny cried, his hand clutching the side of his head in frustration. Now he keeps getting pale suddenly and then fainting. I have no idea what's. You haven't eaten much citrus fruits recently have you? Luffy cut in, his grim expression and concern now gone from his face, replaced with exasperation. Nami on the other hand was openly glaring as a tick mark pulsed on her temple, her left eye twitching in irritation as she took in the injured man's symptoms. Huh? Uh, no we haven't had any recently, Johnny answered. We haven't gotten much chance to eat any fruits lately actually, we've just been eating dried meats and other preservatives that would last long on the seas. You both are fucking idiots, Nami said before disappearing into the storage room. Oi, what was that, Nami? Zoro growled, too agitated about Yosaku's condition to think clearly. Cool it, Zoro, Luffy said tiredly, rubbing his eyes with his fingers as he took a seat next to Yosaku's ill body. Your friend has scurvy. Scurvy, Johnny repeated questioningly as Zoro took deep breaths to calm himself, telling himself Nami must have had a reason for being so cold. Nami was right, you both really are idiots. Luffy commented with half-lidded eyes, aggravating Johnny and making Zoro wonder what the hell it was to make even Luffy act coldly. In the past, it was a hopeless disease that accompanied sea journeys. It's caused by deficiency of plant-derived nutrients, specifically vitamin C. Nami continued, now carrying a box of limes with her. Usopp helped me squeeze a few of these into this guy's mouth. The archer nodded as Luffy tossed him his hunting knife to speed up the process. Wow so he'll be okay after this big sis. Johnny said, elated with joy as he jumped up excitedly. That's some pretty knowledgeable stuff. Are you a doctor or something, big sis? This is common knowledge you fucking dunce. Nami reprimanded the now quivering Johnny who was now hiding behind Zoro, the swordsman also taking an exasperated expression albeit tinged with a bit of guilt. Sorry for flipping out on you. Zoro apologized to Nami who just waved it off. You weren't thinking straight, worried about your friend right? It happens, Nami said back with a smile before frowning as she noticed just how much lime juice Usopp had filled the sick dude's mouth with. Usopp, what the hell? You planning on drowning him or something? Ah, did I overdo it? Usopp cried out, dropping the other limes as he took a look and realized juice was practically overflowing out of Yosaku's mouth. Gee I think, Nami yelled back with shark teeth. Ah big bro they're planning on killing Yosaku after all, Johnny screamed, shaking Zoro with his hands on the swordsman's shoulders. Zoro facepawned at Johnny's last comment as Luffy had his biggest sweat drop experience yet watching the events unfolding in front of him before he looked down in disbelief. It's not possible. Gulping down on the overflow of lime juice, Yosaku jumped to his feet and began dancing as he screamed to the heavens, I will survive. Ecstatic with his partner's instantaneous recovery, Johnny joined Yosaku in his dance as they cheered, Yai! 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 All those nutrients revived me, Yosaku proclaimed proudly. All right, partner, Johnny added with glee, there's no way you can recover that quickly. Nami screeched indignantly once again bringing out the comical shark teeth and angry pure white eyes. The two men stopped their dance to strike a pose in front of the pirate crew and said in unison. Sorry for not introducing ourselves first. My name is Johnny, Johnny said with crossed arms. I'm Yosaku, Yosaku said, placing a cigarette between his lips. The pirate bounty hunter duo, they exclaimed in unison once more. Is this a practice bit? Luffy wondered, taking a peek at his crew's reactions. Zoro looked impassive, Nami still a bit indignant but more surprised at their perfect unison, and Usopp just looked befuddled. 
We used to be colleagues of Big Bro Zoro. Johnny continued. Glad to make your acquaintance. Yosaku finished. I never thought I'd see you guys here, or again for that matter. Zoro said with a small smile. But again, we're surprised. Johnny started. We never imagined that the pirate hunter Zoro would become a pirate himself. Yosaku ended. Yeah well, neither did I. Zoro thrust his hand out with a grin. Big bro. Johnny said with glee taking Zoro's thrust out hand into his own, Yosaku moving to the same only to fall down to the deck, his skin suddenly discolored once more. Thud. H hey partner. Johnny called out to Yosaku in distress, Zoro watching with similar anxiousness as blood poured out the man's oral and nasal orifices once again. Sigh. Put him back on the spare bed and take him into the men's quarters. He needs to rest, Luffy ordered, getting up and walking into the kitchen. The silent continuation of meeting him there afterwards was not lost on the crew and they carried out the command. This is a lesson, Nami began, a grim expression on her face. Pitfalls like these are around every corner when you travel the seas for a long time. Which means on the ship, we have to consider the distribution of nutrients using limited kinds of food, Usopp continued rubbing his hands together nervously. It's a necessary ability, when you think about it, Nami added, as she wrote on notes in her notebook. So basically we need a cook, but doesn't Luffy already fit the bill though? Zoro deduced before launching a different question, one that got Usopp to smile in relief believing the problem was solved. Those hopes were dashed by Nami however. Luffy can cook but, well, the navigator turned to her fiancé who'd been quiet the entire time as he leaned back into his chair at the head of the table, his straw hat covering his eyes. I only know how to make foods that require game or can be smoked roasted. And I don't know much about the endemic life on the Grand Line, what's safe to eat and what isn't, what parts to keep and what not to, etc. Luffy said, looking at them for the first time since they all convened in the kitchen. I can only get us so far on our journey with my knowledge on cuisine. We need an actual seafaring cook, one that can fight. Taking this as his cue to chip in Johnny smiled, putting his two cents in. If you're looking for a cook that can fight, there's only one place to go in these seas. Oh, do tell. Luffy questioned a small smile appearing on his face. At the moment it's on the way to the Grand Line, west of here, and, turning to Zoro, Johnny grinned knowing the swordsman would like the next bit of info. Rumors say a certain hawk-eyed man is on the way. Zoro lit up like a kid who'd just gotten the pet dinosaur they'd begged their parents' ages for, only to sober and glance towards Nami. Nami, is your hometown near the Grand Line? Zoro inquired. Meeting the greatest swordsman in the world so soon would be. Zoro couldn't even put into words how wonderful that would be but he knew Nami needed to be home. The specifics weren't shared to him or Usopp but they knew Luffy made a promise to save her home from a tyrant and it sounds like a solution to the problem was long overdue. Kind of but, it isn't towards the west, Nami said, biting her lip in frustration. She knew it was Zoro's dream to be the greatest swordsman in the world and, Based on his reaction, the, hawk-eyed man, was most likely the current holder of that title. Luffy was conflicted on this matter. On one hand, he would basically be getting in the way of his swordsman's dream and he would die before he did such a thing to any of his friends, but on the other hand he promised Nami he'd deal with Arlong back in her hometown, that was their deal for her becoming their navigator, and his queen. I suppose I could send Usopp to accompany Zoro and his two bounty hunter friends to go to the restaurant and meet Mahawk while I go with Nami and deal with that overgrown sardine, Luffy opened his mouth to suggest it but was silenced by his fiancée who answered first. Usopp. Change the course of the ship, we're heading to the restaurant. Nami said with a tone of finality. Her order shocked Usopp, Zoro and even Luffy himself but the marksman knew better than to argue and left to carry out the navigator's command. Nami, are you sure? Your village? Zoro knew he'd just been granted a golden opportunity but he couldn't just accept it like that. Nami was having none of it however and raised her hand to stop him from going on. He won't be expecting me for at least another week. We have time to get a cook and meet this hawk-eyed man. Nami said, getting up from her seat and giving Zoro a wide smile. It's your dream isn't it? The swordsman could only nod as his lips refused to function, unable to comprehend what the navigator was willing to do for him. Knowing his words would not come out, Zoro bowed his head in thanks, not seeing the satisfaction and happiness that came alive in Nami's eyes before she walked out the kitchen. Well Nami has spoken, better to just listen and go along with it than to argue. Luffy said getting off his seat as well to follow her but he stopped as he passed Zoro's side and leaned down to his swordsman's ear. For payment, I think making the tyrant's men suffer slow agonizing deaths would be a good start. Then they will beg for death thousands of times before I grant it to them. Zoro replied, eyes ice cold and resolved to shine brighter than the sun. Luffy grinned and patted his first mate's shoulder fondly before walking out the door and walking to stand by his love's side. Are you sure about this? Luffy asked, although he knew the answer. Nami's eyes said it all, her decision was final. They say when you fall in love with someone you end up becoming like them. Nami turned to Luffy with a smile on her lips as she threw her arms around her captain's neck. Getting in the way of my friend's dreams, I'd die before I ever do such a thing. Luffy didn't say anything else, instead he closed the distance between them, lifting Nami by her thighs as he captured her lips. The Oranget made a startled sound before melting into her captain's searing kiss, her fingers playing with his hair as he leaned against the balcony's railing. In the distance a strange ship came to view, its form reminiscent of a carp, its front the fish's head and its rudder the tail. 
The top section above the seat was painted light green and the bottom with a little peeking out the waves painted a faded red, the ship. The restaurant's name displayed in big bold letters on its second story, the Bharati. Well the owner certainly has, unique tastes. Nami commented, taking in the ship's appearance. Glancing to her boyfriend expecting to see similar feelings written on his face, the navigator blinked seeing his rather unbecoming display. I can smell it, Luffy muttered, saliva water falling down his mouth as the sense of what had to be the best smelling dishes he'd ever caught with of were brought to him by the ocean breeze. We're getting a cook from here if it's the last thing we do. So he can be a complete caveman at times too huh? Nami thought in amusement, shaking her head at her usually calm collected lover's complete monkey mode transformation. Turning to Zoro she was both relieved and a bit disappointed to see that the swordsman was still sporting his usual resting bitch face. Well at least being brought into the pack doesn't automatically make you regress in the evolutionary line. Nami didn't have high hopes for us of not returning to Monk seeing as the marksman was also drooling uncontrollably the moment the scent of the dishes became available to the normal humans on board. Well, this is a definite ape. Kaya, what did you see in this guy? I present to you all, the sea restaurant, the Bharati. Johnny yelled as if he were a showman making a dramatic reveal. Meat, Luffy cried bouncing with energy, his monkey D jeans overriding whatever fear of shame for becoming a caveman-esque individual. Calm down, you idiot. Nami yelled, slamming her fist on her embarrassing fiancé's head, sending the wolfman straight into the floorboards of the deck with a grunt of pain. Completely incensed as she was she didn't notice the black sheen her fist had been coated with, her other two crew members did notice however, the swordsman openly gaping. A armament, Zoro exclaimed disbelievingly, staring at the navigator's black fist. His cry of surprise was enough to snap Nami away from her livid state, consequently giving her a chance to notice she had indeed activated armament hockey. I spar with this bastard every bloody afternoon until I'm basically dead and you summon armament hockey perfectly just out of being embarrassed. If Luffy were awake he would have been simultaneously ecstatic and shocked beyond disbelief, unfortunately the hockey-coated fist his girlfriend punched him with had enough power to actually knock him out. This fact scared him more than it made him proud. He was proud of her, don't get him wrong but knowing even with his insane devil fruit his queen could knock him out that easily, well that certainly gave him reason to fear for the future. While this fact was lost on Zoro and Nami, the former incensed and the latter still in shock, it was not lost on Usopp, who paled, and swore to himself to never get on the navigator's bad side, yeah this was not a promise he kept. The noise of a honking ship passing them awoke the downed Luffy whose ears rang in pain, his swordsman gritting his teeth and throwing a glare at the marine ship that came up to the going Mary's side. WH what? A marine ship at a place like this? Yosaku cried from the door leading into the men's quarters. Ugh, what an unpleasant bunch we've run into. Zoro complained as he held one hand against the side of his head, still reeling from the loud noise. Fuck for all the benefits, there are a fuck ton of downsides. This gift curses as much as it blesses. When did they get so close? Nami wondered if she'd been taking the cheat day a bit too breezily. I trained so much in observation hockey I ended up being able to predict and sense everything in battle yet I didn't notice them at all. Johnny recognizing the ship and a certain man on board attempted to discreetly hide in the men's quarters before he himself was recognized in turn. Luffy stood up and watched the marine, the commanding officer he deduced, with a blank stare, giving nothing away. I've never seen that pirate flag. The marine murmured. The commanding officer wore a white pinstripe suit, a sky blue collared dress shirt underneath, and brass knuckles on his hands. His skin was tan and his hair purplish pink, narrow dot like pupils and a scar on his right cheek. The pinket called out to Luffy and his crew, I am Iron Fist Full Body, Lieutenant at Navy Headquarters. Who is your captain? Come out and state your name. I am the captain, Monkey D. Luffy. The wolfman said, his face still blank as his eyes bored into full bodies, filling the marine lieutenant with a sense of foreboding danger but the man just shrugged it off. As for why you've never seen this pirate flag before, it's because it was only flown recently. At the same time Luffy opened his mouth to speak, Usopp attempted to step forward and speak as well but was stopped by Zoro who held him back by his shoulders, a withering death glare reminding the marksman that now was not the time for jokey insubordination. H-M-P-H. Oh, you're just, hm. Full body's face broke into a smirk before he noticed a familiar pair of jokers by one of the pirate ship's doors. You two over there, I remember seeing you before. If I remember correctly, you're a bounty hunter duo going after small fish. W-H what? Johnny said angrily as both he and Yosaku stepped away from their hiding place to scowl at the marine lieutenant. So you finally got caught by pirates, that's a laugh. Full body chuckled as a rather lovely blonde woman in a red velvet dress approached him from behind. Come on, let's get going. The woman said, hugging full body's right arm, pressing it into her breasts. Full body nodded and turned away from the two men, a pair of pathetic bounty hunters worth nothing more than dirt in his mind. You think small-time bounty hunters would go after these guys? Exclamation mark quote. Johnny called out to the lieutenant, taking a stack of bounties from his blue jacket and tossing them to the wind. Many of these bounties had the faces crossed out in a red X but one of the few without one laid above the pile, a fishman with a saw nose grinning in the picture. Nami noticed it and glared hatefully as she crouched down and held it in her quivering hands. Luffy and Zoro also noticed but made no move to approach the navigator, the two shared a brief glance with one another and decided it best to leave Nami alone for the moment in favor of observing for the marine vessel next to them may do next. Now, let's go to the restaurant. 
Full body said to his lady companion but not before turning to his men for one last command before he had lunch. They're nice or, sink them. Sir, the two marine soldiers saluted, acknowledging the order before rushing to carry it out. See crap they're gonna fire at us. Usopp cried out in panic as Johnny and Yosaku nervously observed the navigator quivering in anger as she held the fishman's bounty. Shashashashashashas. The arrogant bastard's condescending laugh echoed in Nami's ears as she saw Red, not even registering what was going on around her until the sound of cannon fire knocked her out of her stupor. Subconsciously activating observation hockey, Nami watched as a cannonball sailed through the air towards their ship, straight at, Luffy. Realizing where it was headed, Nami's heart thudded against her chest, logically she knew he'd walk out unscathed but that didn't stop her from feeling anxiety. Of course the anxiety was proven unnecessary as Luffy simply raised his arm and caught the explosive projectile lazily, shocking the bounty hunter duo and the marines so much a cacophony of, thud. Resounded as jaws dropped and hit the deck. I'm too hungry to play catch right now so you can have this back. Luffy said impassively before throwing the cannonball at the marine ship's hull, breaking it and causing the vessel to begin sinking, sending all its occupants running around in a frenzy as panic set in. Turning to his crew, Luffy smiled goofily, a bit of drool leaked out of his mouth as he declared with all seriousness. I'm ordering all the non-vegetarian, no crustacean dishes they have. Cue the main crew's sweat drop and, oi, oi, as the bounty hunter duo screams disbelievingly, their brains refusing to accept what they just bore witness to. Later in the restaurant, Luffy and company are seated by one of the servers on a window side table, also giving them menus to choose what they wish to order. While the server moved to leave and give them time to choose, Luffy immediately followed through with his declaration from the going merry. I'll have every non-vegetarian, zero crustacean and or shellfish dish you got. Luffy said with a beaming smile, only to have the server sputter in befuddlement as he stared disbelievingly as the wolfman, well they didn't know he was a wolfman but that didn't change the fact he was one. Luffy's thousand watt smile wavered however as he caught the scent of cigarette smoke, the nauseating smell coming from a blonde man in a black suit, blue collar dress shirt, black tie, and black steel toe boots. The blonde who also had swirling eyebrows faltered seeing the disgruntled look on Luffy's face before immediately tossing his cigarette into a bin, making an educated guess as to what displeased the customer. Even if we take non-vegetarian, no crustacean and or shellfish dishes out of the equation, that's still a lot of food. The blonde man said as he eyed Luffy calculatingly. You don't look like you've gone that long without food, so why so much? This restaurant is serving dishes wafting with the most delectable aromas I've ever had the pleasure of experiencing. It'd be a shame not to indulge in each and every delicacy I possibly can. Luffy answered, his bright smile back in full force as he answered who he assumed to be a high-ranking employee of the Bharati. Then did you mean to request a sampling of each dish that fit in your given parameters instead? The blonde asked Luffy, a small smile on his lips as he preened proudly at the praise. Nope. Luffy said, ignoring the frown that formed on the man's lips before addressing what he deduced to be the man's concerns. If you're worried about food being wasted then I'm sure my three companions here can vouch for me and my, well ravenous appetite. The bland decided to do just that and cast questioning glances to his companions, stopping at the beautiful orange-haired girl. Does he speak the truth, dear mademoiselle? The man asked in a rather flirty manner. Nami noticed the rather candid flirting of the admittedly attractive blonde man but decided to clarify her status before Luffy, whose eyes took on a dangerous gleam, or Zoro, whose hand gripped tightly on his precious white sheathed blade, tore the man to shreds. Yes, my fiancé does have quite an insatiable appetite. It runs in his family. The blonde man blinked before bowing to Luffy, apologies sir, I did not know the fair lady was your betrothed. Stand up, my good man. My fault, I suppose, for not giving her a ring to openly show it. Luffy said placating the blonde man who smiled gratefully for being forgiven. No food served to me will be wasted I promise. To waste food while being a sailor on these unforgiving seas is the height of disrespect and stupidity after all. Truer words have never been spoken. The blonde man said, fully grinning in agreement. What would the rest of you like to order? I will personally see to cooking them up for all of you. Zoro eyed the blonde man apprehensively. Awfully generous of you, what's your position here anyway? Ah, right I should have introduced myself first. Ahem, my name is Sanji and I am the sous chef of the sea restaurant, the Bharati. The blonde man replied coolly, the green-haired swordsman in front of him reminiscent of a wild animal, a ferocious tiger. Definitely fills a combat-focused role on this lucky guy's ship. Sanji assessed as he glanced briefly at the man with the ravenous appetite, the captain. Dishes cooked and served by the sous chef himself. I must be in heaven. Luffy exclaimed, too enamored with the offer to care about being assessed or about embarrassing his fiancée who just sighed in resignation. My usually calm, collected husband-to-be, regressed in the evolutionary line as soon as he caught a whiff of your dishes and since he has the best sniffer I know, well, surprise me. Nami decided to let the blonde sous chef serve whatever he wanted. A decision that elated Sanji greatly, just because a woman was promised to another or anything of the sort did not mean they did not receive the treatment any single woman should enjoy. I have no preferences either. Usopp, Zoro turned to the marksman who closed the menu and shook his head as well, both agreeing to let the expert decide for himself. Very well then, I'll get to work on your entrees. Sanji said as a basket of freshly baked bread was placed on the table by the server who brought them to their seats in the first place. Appetizers are fresh loaves of bread, straight out of the oven. Listen closely and you'll hear the crackle inside. 
Luffy and Zoro could already hear it without bringing it close but still did so before taking a bite, the swordsman's eyes widening as his jaw slackened. How the hell is bread this good? He asked before looking up to see his captain leaning against his seat and eating slowly, savoring each and every bite with bliss. The rather refined display alleviated some of the embarrassment Nami felt for her monk of a boyfriend as she sighed in relief taking Sanji up on his advice and bringing a loaf close to her ear. Crackle. The navigator's eyes flew open as her mouth parted in surprise. Yes, she was told there would be a crackle but she wasn't expecting it to be so loud, and certainly not as inviting as it was. Great, aside from becoming more considerate of others I also might end up regressing in the evolutionary line at some point. Yusa. Well the marksman ate like he normally did, probably out of fear as he didn't forget what he saw Nami do back on the ship. If the freaking bread was this good, no way was he missing out on the entrees just because he started eating like a pig and triggering the navigator's fury. Johnny and Yosaku watched enviously from a different table, the two didn't want to impose on Luffy and the others so they asked to be seated separately so they would pay for their own bill. Now, boy did they wish they hadn't given two shits about protecting their pride. Luffy grinned in glee as he spotted Sanji walking out the kitchen with a tray in hand before frowning and turning to the restaurant's door seconds before a certain disgruntled marine lieutenant burst through, soaked. Straw hat, where are you, you bastard? Full body yelled at the top of his lungs as his eyes darted from patron to patron before landing on Luffy and his crew. Seething with red-hot rage the marine lieutenant furiously stomped over the table as Sanji began placing the dishes for the straw hat crew, ignoring the soaked man. How dare you open fire on my ship, you no-name pirate. Luffy just stared at full body blankly, before turning to his front and seeing a filet mignon served with mashed potatoes and mixed vegetables, carrots, corn and peas, a sauce plate filled with creamy wild mushroom sauce. Luffy took a knife and sliced into the filet mignon, parting the juicy piece of meat to see its temperature, medium rare. Perfect. Luffy praised as he cut off a little bite-sized chunk to begin his meal. Full body was not amused. You dare ignore me. Quit eating you cocky shit. Pulling his arm back, full body screamed bloody murder as he went to punch the serene captain trying to enjoy his steak. Faster than he could comprehend what was happening, the marine lieutenant's body was suddenly sent flying through the restaurant as the sous chef delivered a barrage of kicks too fast for the normal eye to see, the only indication that he even kicked at all was his raised leg. To the normal patrons dining in the restaurant that was the only indication, but to the straw hat gang who got a crash course on observation hockey. They saw the whole thing unfold and boy was it a surprise. Zoro grimaced as he glanced at his captain before sighing in resignation, the decision of who would be their ship's cook was made. Why couldn't it be anyone but the flirt? While Luffy had only taken notice of Sanji when he approached them, Zoro had spotted the man already making rounds around the restaurant doing his job while also flirting with numerous women. Least the perv has standards. While Sanji was quite the flirt he tended to rein it in for the women who were obviously not single, he still treated them highly but his flirting became more joking like the kind shared between old friends rather than a suitor. If you have problems with our customers you can deal with them after they've eaten and had their fill, otherwise, Sanji let the threat hang in the air as he stood protectively between the lieutenant and the pirates. Luffy continued eating his meal with a serene expression on his face, not giving away any of his thoughts on his meal. Ah, Sanji what are you doing to our customer? And it's a marine lieutenant as well. A bald man with strangely large arms yelled before he rapidly approached the downed lieutenant, glaring at Sanji all the while. Explain yourself Sanji. The customers are kings. You don't treat kings like this. He isn't a customer. He was picking a fight with our customers right here. Sanji said coolly gesturing to the straw hat gang behind him, who all took to their captain's lead and started eating as well. Unlike their captain however, the other three openly showed their surprise and delight as they ate their food, Zoro more begrudgingly than his navigator and marksman. And don't call me by my name like we're friends, damn cook. A damn cook has no right to call me, damn cook. The beefy armed man grumbled before standing back up straight, dropping the marine lieutenant to the floor, full body gasping out in pain as his body crashed back down due to gravity. He telling the truth, boys. The man with strangely proportioned arms asked a group of waiters by the kitchen doors. Yes, Patty, Eggplant here was dealing with the lieutenant who came in picking a fight with one of our customers. A new voice called out as its owner walked out the kitchen. A rather short, pot-bellied man with an amusingly tall chef's hat and a peg leg. Sanji grumbled about the nickname but simply walked back towards the kitchen, pausing for a moment noticing and recognizing what the head chef was bringing along with him. Owner Zeph, Patty yelled in surprise, watching the chef, Zeph, walk towards Luffy and his crew with a large sake bottle. Your old man left this with me when he passed by. Figured you'd come across here looking for a chef on your way to the Grand Line. The chef, Zeph, grunted, carefully placing the bottle in front of the straw hat wearing captain in a black and gold coat. While Luffy showed no visual reaction aside from calmly picking up the bottle and giving the top part a whiff, his crew all stopped eating to stare at the peg-legged chef and then the bottle in shock. Having delivered the young man his father's gift, Zeph turned to the marine lieutenant, picking himself off the floor and back on his feet. I'll shut it down, I'll shut down this restaurant. I'll shut it down. Full body's grumble gradually became louder and louder, the man facing the ground not noticing the chef walking ever closer. I'll contact the government immediately and... Wham! Zeph kicked full body in the face with his peg leg, sending the pinket crashing into a wall next to the door. Get out of my restaurant! Zeph said coldly, 
staring down the government dog with a displeased expression, as if he was a piece of trash that the chef had forgotten to take out the night before. Full body gasped out in pain crumpled against the wall, clutching the side of his face that was struck by the chef. Around this time Sanji walked out the kitchen carrying two trays with seven dishes each, all varying kinds of meat from land-dwelling creatures as well as some fish. Walking to Luffy's table Sanji eyed the empty plate that once held the filet mignon, empty as if it looked like it just came out the dishwasher, squeaky clean with not a tinge of color aside from white. I take it you like the filet mignon? Sanji asked as he set about placing the fourteen dishes onto the table. Juicy and tender, seared to perfection on both sides, the temperature, medium rare cooked with incredible finesse, a beautiful pink center, the vegetables sautéed in butter giving it a very inviting aroma, and the mashed potatoes, no clumps, completely exquisite with the addition of parsley and just the right amount of cream. Luffy answered in the same way a critique did, cold and calculating. Both Usopp and Zoro's eyes bugged out hearing and seeing the way Luffy talked. What happened to the monk? They screamed demandingly in their minds. Nami was similarly stunned but was torn, one part of her mind was delighted by the class her lover was exuding, the other part seethed wondering where this guy was while the caveman was embarrassing her earlier. Sanji's mouth gaped, flabbergasted by the complete 180 the wolfman pulled off before a grin of satisfaction settled on his features. Chef Zef, mind if I take your sous chef as my cook? And there went Sanji's grin. Yeah, sure take him, he's the best cook I got and basically my son though so he better make it back here in one piece someday. Zef said, refusing to turn around and let Sanji see his face. The sous chef looked like he wanted to argue about Zef just giving him away like a piece of furniture willy-nilly but the words of protest were caught in his throat when the chef continued from where he left off. Before any further touching moments between Zef and Sanji could unfold though, a wounded marine soldier appeared in front of the door. L. Lieutenant. Lieutenant full body. The man called out, getting the downed lieutenant's attention as well as everyone else's. T. The Krieg pirate we apprehended, he's free sir. All traces of pain and fatigue were washed away from full body's features as the marine stood up and faced his subordinate with fear in his eyes. Impossible. We captured him while he was drifting along the seas, starving. We haven't fed him since either. While full body denied the marine soldiers' claims, the patrons in the restaurant began murmuring amongst themselves. K. Krieg pirates. No, it can't be. We're doomed, doomed. They're said to be the strongest pirates in the East Blue. The bloody marine soldier looked down regretfully. I'm very sorry Liu Ah. Bang. The soldier's body crumpled at the door as the sound of gunfire permeated throughout the restaurant. The figure of a heavily injured scruffy man in steel dark green boats, gray sweatpants, gray track jacket with purple stripes along its side and red dragons at the flaps, a green undershirt and a purple striped gray bandana holding a gun came to view as the marine hit the floor. While the patrons looked at the newcomer in fear, Zef, Sanji and Patty just looked at him dully. A new customer. He better have money. Patty grumbled as he took out a piece of parchment to write the newcomer's orders on. The shooter walked in and took a seat at one of the vacant tables, propping one foot on it as he leaned back into his chair. Give me food, anything is fine. The shooter said roughly, eyes and cheeks sunken, ribs poking through his shirt, the man clearly suffering from starvation. This is a restaurant, right? Welcome to the Barati, you damn crook. Patty said with a, interesting smiley face. Pretty sure you'll scare off more customers than get them with a smile like that. Nami and Yusuf sweat dropped as they had the same thought, Luffy activated his observation hockey so he could continue eating while still being aware of any sudden attacks the Creed pirate might spring. Zoro watched the man with sympathy, remembering the hellish three weeks he spent in the marine base in Shell's town. I'll say it only one more time, so listen well. Bring me food, the shooter said, his eyes shadowing as his patience thinned. Full body grimaced at the tone and muttered, this cook's going to be killed. Scratching his head, Patty asked the shooter, sir, I'm terribly sorry, but do you have money for that? In response the shooter held the flintlock up to Patty's head and replied, would a bullet do? So you don't have money, huh? Patty's face lost its creepy smile and morphed into a bored scowled face, the transformation was so abrupt that it caught the shooter off guard long enough for Patty to raise his hands up and put them together before smashing them onto the bandana wearing man's head, striking with so much force he broke the chair the guy was sitting on as well. If you can't pay for the food, you're not a customer. The surprised patrons and staff burst into happy cheers. Beat the pirate up, Patty San. Way to go, cook. Teach that scoundrel what's what. Grumble grumble. Oh, your stomach is grumbling, pirate. Patty said coldly as he stared down the shooter who held his stomach in pain. That was a fart, you stupid raccoon dog. Just bring me food, the bandana wearing man said, not sporting a nosebleed as well as streak of blood streaming from his oral orifice as well. Patty was not amused. If you're not a customer, beat it already. Patty yelled as he began beating up the downed man, Sanji having left earlier back into the kitchen with an unreadable expression. Luffy's eyes flashed with disappointment briefly as he observed Patty's display of brutality and the cowardice of the marines who sneaked away with their tails between their legs, before curiosity set in, sensing the resolve blooming to life in Sanji. More and more you make yourself the perfect and only candidate for becoming my cook. Luffy mused as he dabbed a napkin against his lips before he stood up and left the table without a sound, his crew casting him questioning looks, Nami moving to join him as he gestured towards the back of the restaurant. Usopp looked like he wanted to get up as well but Zoro held the archer down and shook his head, having a pretty good guess what the two were going to be doing. 
Luffy's paw I shook my head watching Patty throw the Creed pirate off his shoulder and onto the deck with absolutely no regard for the starving man's constitution. Nami's frown deepened as she observed the injured man struggling to even prop himself up against the restaurant's wall. What are we here for Luffy? Nami asked me, turning to me disgusted by the cook's behavior. I was under the impression we were scouting out potential crewmates, specifically Sanji. In response I just pressed my finger to my lips and nodded to the door which was opened by the man of the hour himself, carrying a plate of seafood fried rice, octopus tentacles, squid rings, parsley, shrimp and bite-sized portions of fish mixed into the rice. Eat it, Sanji said, leaning against the railing, lighting a cigarette which he took a deep breath of before puffing out a long stream of smoke. God this hits the spot. Shish shut up, take this away, I ain't so far down I'll take charity. The starving man yelled, facing away from the meal but never taking his eyes off of it. Stop bitchin, and eat it already. To me, anyone who's hungry is a customer. Sanji took another deep breath before sighing out in relief and exasperation. Sorry, but I'm not a customer. The Krieg pirate retorted, clinging to the last vestiges of his pride. Sanji's exasperated glare narrowed in fury before he sighed and looked to the skies. How large and cruel the ocean is, how scary it is to lose food and water on the ocean, how hard it is, I can understand how a hungry person feels more than anyone. The starving man's pride was on the brink of fading completely as the sous chef's words hit home but the blonde wasn't finished. You can die and keep your pride, but if you eat and survive, don't you think there's a future for you? The man gasped before reaching for the seafood fried rice and devouring the meal as fast as he could, taking large chunks after large chunks without rest. Sorry, the man said, getting Sanji's attention. Sorry, thank you, I thought I'd die. The man cried, tears streaming down his face uncontrollably. I thought I was done, the pirate resumed eating his meal ravenously. Delicious, delicious, I've never eaten food so delicious. A smug shit-eating grin blessed the blonde's face as he preened. It's damn delicious, isn't it? Any objections, love? Turning to Nami, I asked more out of formality rather than necessity, knowing she had probably also found Sanji to be the one. The cook was destined to sail the seas with us. None. Well if I had to nitpick it would be not having a dream. Nami answered, turning to me with a beautiful smile. Not to say he doesn't have one but we don't know if he does and should he have one we don't know if it aligns with our own. One way to find out then, leaning over the railing I called out to the man who was almost guaranteed to become my seafaring cook. Sanji, you got a dream? An ambition? The sous chef shifted, startled at being called out so suddenly before locking eyes with me and relaxing a bit. What's it to you, Emperor's son? Oh, you know about my father, E.H. I questioned with a grin, going along with his change of topic, for now. He may be peg-legged and pot-bellied now but Chef Zef was once a grand line pirate himself, re, Sanji replied before being cut off by me. Red leg Zef. I finished, sparing a glance at the Krieg pirate who paused in his eating upon hearing about Zef being a grand line pirate. He made it pretty far in paradise as captain of the Cook Pirates but didn't break through into the new world. Still made it out and settled into a much tamer livelihood though, an accomplishment not many others can boast. You know your stuff, Sanji said back blinking slowly, probably not expecting me to know so much about his mentor. I do have a dream, and it does require me to sail through the Grand Line, I grinned widely and opened my mouth to speak but Sanji continued with a dead serious expression, but I can't set sail until I've paid my debt to Zef. I honestly don't know when I will be able to so I doubt I can be your cook. Contrary to Sanji's belief, that his proclamation would displease me, I just took it in stride, focusing on one key detail. So you do have a dream that aligns with my own, E.H. Well then I really can't accept any other cook aside from you now. I crossed my arms and grinned down smugly at the bewildered sous chef. Join my crew and let's find that which you seek. Sanji's eyes widened momentarily before he shook his head with a grin. Well, if you can wait that long I won't stop you. Food isn't cheap though. It's worth every belly, I declared confidently before taking out a pouch of coins and tossing it to the blonde. That's for our starving friend. I turned away to walk back into the restaurant not really interested in listening to the Krieg pirate's feeble protests or gratitude, Nami following me with a conflicted expression. If he isn't ready yet, you and I can pay him a little visit and just come back to pick Sanji and the others up. Thank you, Luffy, sorry I'm. You're not a bother or a hindrance, Nami. I stopped her self-deprecating apology as I turned to her and held her chin up, forcing her to face me. You'll never be anything of the sort. Not to me, as Nami smiled appreciatively at me I basked in the glow, oblivious to how someday she would be a hindrance, she and the entire crew would pull me away from my journey. But that would not come until much later, and even if I lost some time, the choice of being pulled away was one I would take over losing them forever. The Bharati 2 Don Krieg appears in Sanji's promise. No one's paw of four days pass as the straw hat gang continues to frequent Bharati. The prices of the sea restaurant are no joke and while the golden treasure on the ship would last them for long periods, Luffy felt his safety at night would be, tested if he just kept using up those funds. Of all the women in the world, you choose the greediest one there is. Luffy rolled his eyes internally as he continued stalking towards his prey. Honestly, I've been around for millennia and I have never seen any other with as insatiable a desire for gold as her. If you take away the specificity of gold, I'm sure your greed outclasses hers by light years. Luffy mentally retorted as he crouched behind some bushes, watching his target anxiously peek around before taking a drink from the calm river. 
No longer keeping its eyes on the lookout for predators, the large herbivore's life came to an abrupt but painless end as Luffy shaved right next to it, embedding his claw through the beast's brain from underneath its jaw. That's another day of free meals. The large herbivore was about three meters long and two meters wide, that is to say, those were the dimensions of its main body. It had a long tail that ended in a spiked club and a short furry head. The creature stood on four stubby legs and was protected by a large, sturdy rock-hard shell. To be honest it looked like an overgrown pig with a turtle shell, and a mixture of a stegosaurus and ankylosaurus tail. The bizarre creature was one that Zeph rarely got to cook since the majority of people capable of hunting it were few and far between here on the East Blue. To Luffy however, the thing was a pushover. Makes me wish we could return to Don Island and hunt those massive bunnies. That old hag may look rough but she could cook one hell of a rabbit stew. Luffy groaned at the memory, knowing the bastard was right and oh so wishing the beast would shut up already. Muttering strings of curses that would have Makino scrubbing his mouth with soap, Luffy tossed the creature over his shoulder and started jumping his way back to the ship, docked at the far side of the island. Luffy's got the weird but delicious animal, raise the tails and lift the anchor. Nami ordered as she walked to the wheel of the ship, adjusting course to return them back to the Barati. Thud, dumping the strange creature onto the deck, Luffy stretched his arms upwards before taking a rock and throwing it towards the back of Usopp's head, the marksman tilting to the side to dodge the projectile without even turning around. Luffy smiled as he took another rock and threw it towards Zoro who, in response, drew his swords out and made multiple slashes before grabbing the sculpted rock right as it was going to hit the floorboard, the rock now in the form of a wolf head, similar to the Jolly Roger they flew but without the straw hat and crossbones. Don't bother Luffy, I can already hear your intent of throwing it at my right foot. Nami stated impassively before she made her way to Usopp's workshop. The marksman chuckled, patting his pouting captain on the shoulder before going inside his workshop as well. A few minutes pass in comfortable silence between the wolfman and his vice-captain, both enjoying the cool windy day that helped push the going Mary along her way even quicker. The mood however dampened as Zoro sighed, something clearly weighing on his mind. Quote dot dot dot, we're getting close to her deadline, Luffy. Zoro leaned against the wall, sliding against it as he took a seat, observing the carved stone. Arrow Cook hasn't done whatever it is he needs to repay and Mahawk hasn't shown himself yet. Luffy sighed before taking a seat next to his first mate. I think Nami and I will have to pay her village a visit ourselves and just double back to pick you guys up, something tells me we won't have to though. Zoro raised his eyebrow in question hearing his captain's last comment, mind sharing, why that is. Something's not right. Luffy answered, his eyes narrowing as he sniffed the passing winds, nothing dangerous to me or you, I can't say the same about Nami or Usopp though. The sea restaurant was in the distance, its form harder to see through the fog. The swordsman turned to his captain curiously, even with the training you've been putting them through? Usopp doesn't have actual machetes yet and while his marksmanship is superb it leaves him vulnerable to opponents who can close the distance between them. Luffy stated coolly, Nami has certainly built up some muscle and has one hell of a punch but while her observation hockey has definitely grown a lot she hasn't been able to consciously activate armament hockey. You're right, unless it's decking you, me or Usopp when she gets frustrated she hasn't actually been able to trigger it. Zoro mused, the navigator seemingly only able to draw upon armament hockey when she teaches any one of them a lesson. Since you said it's not a threat to me though. It isn't Mahawk, Luffy answered, shooting his vice captain a sympathetic look. The swordsman sighed in disappointment as the going Mary entered the fog bank, only a seconds away from the Barati. That was when Luffy noticed a silhouette in the distance, its features indistinguishable in the fog but clearly a very large sea vessel. Say, what was Krieg's Jolly Roger again? Don Krieg, Zoro questioned to confirm, continuing after Luffy nodded. An hourglass on each side of the skull, why? Looks like the so-called ruler of the East Blue is paying us a visit, and Jin was probably the one who led him here. Luffy indicated to the silhouette in the distance, a distance that was quickly getting smaller and smaller as the ship became ever larger. Both ships arrived at the Barati simultaneously, the fog dissipating at the exact same moment to reveal the Krieg pirate's ship, or what was left of it. What could do that to a galleon that big? Nami exclaimed as she exited Usopp's workshop. Definitely not anything natural, doesn't look like it came from cannon fire either. Usopp commented equally surprised by the massive ship's current state before noticing the flag. Ah, it's the Krieg pirates. Slap, Luffy hit Usopp up the head glaring at the archer as he clutched his ears, Usopp having screamed at the top of his lungs right next to the wolfman. Zoro was giving Usopp a look that promised pain in their next sparring session, leaving the marksman to gulp nervously. Grab your weapons, we're gonna see what this guy's made of, Luffy ordered as he jumped off the Mary and made his way to the restaurant, whistling without a care in the world. Is he serious? We should be. Bonk. Zoro huffed as he grabbed the unconscious Usopp by his foot and started dragging him towards the restaurant without a word. Nami just sighed as she went to grab her and Usopp's weapons, knowing Luffy was in captain mode right now and any protest she may have would fall on deaf ears. Inside the restaurant, the patrons stood stiffly, anxiously observing the large shadow making its way towards the door. The chefs, Barsanji and Zef, in similar states of nervousness, patty sweating bullets the most. Look what you've brought upon us, you buffoon. A shorter cook with brown hair and dark round shades glared daggers at a disproportionate man, who held his head in his hands in fear. You're gonna get rid of them, right? I didn't think Creed would go so far for just one man. Patty yelled back, hyperventilating. 
While the cooks and patrons all panicked, Zef and Sanji stood by and waited calmly, the Straw Hat Gang however were mostly bored. Maybe Nami and Usopp could take them on after all, Krieg and Jin aside. Luffy mumbled as he widened the scope of his observation hockey to get a read on the crew Krieg had. Even if they were full, that crew of his is pathetic. All they have is quantity and next to no quality. So I take Jin and you take a crack at Krieg? Zoro asked his captain with a bored look. Nami and Usopp dealing with the rats he has on board. Nami looked vaguely irritated with the assessment, she was fine with not being able to stand up to Krieg, the man was the captain and strongest after all but Jin. Jin's most likely the vice captain of the Krieg pirates, Nami. Zoro said with narrowed eyes, watching Jin bring Krieg towards the door. Talk to Johnny and Yosaku after the guy left before, apparently he's got a higher bounty than Django, and is known for being a frontline combatant. In other words, you've made great progress. Fighting him and living to tell the tale is definitely possible for you. Defeating him, well, you could but, Luffy didn't finish his statement, and Nami didn't need him to. She knew she could beat Jin, maybe even Krieg, but it definitely would not be a fight in her favor. Now as said earlier, most of the straw hats were bored, Usopp was too panicked and filled with the horrifying tales of the Krieg pirates to think straight thus not even considering checking with Haki if he could stand up against them. This resulted in a slap to the back of the head from the navigator who reprimanded him and ordered him to man up and clear his head. Sometimes I wonder if you're the captain. Usopp grumbled, but did as told anyway. She is going to be his wife so, Zoro trailed off with a smirk as the marksman groaned right as the door opened to reveal Krieg in all his, glory. Instead of the terrifying pirate captain of the Krieg pirates, known for having 50 pirate ships and 5,000 pirates, the man who stood at the entrance looked like someone who just went through the ringer. His impressive 8 feet 0 inches height hunched over as he was supported by Jin, his eyes that were said to strike fear in all who entered his gaze, unfocused and tired. S sorry, can I have some water and food? Krieg asked, shivering continuously, throwing everyone for a loop. This was the infamous Don Krieg. We have money, tons of money. I comma I don't even remember the last time I ate. Please, give me some food, some water. Sanji stared down at Krieg for a moment from the stairs leading to the kitchen before ascending them. No one but Luffy and Zef noticed but neither paid much attention to it. Moments passed as the patrons and cooks whispered amongst one another in disbelief, watching the undignified and pathetic display of the so-called strongest pirate captain in the East Blue. Krieg groaned in pain before he lost the strength to even stand, the new unexpected weight causing Jin to panic as he could no longer support his captain who crumpled and laid flat on the floor. Sea Captain, Thud, D Don Creed. Jin cried out in panic as his captain's already unfocused eyes became clear white. P please, help our captain, he's really about to starve, he hasn't eaten anything for days, he'll die if he doesn't eat. Jin's pleas fell on deaf ears, as the patrons got over their anxiousness and glared at him and his captain in disgust. Ha 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 ha, this is good, it's a riot to see the infamous arch rogue Don Creed like this. Patty sported an ear-splitting smile, all traces of fear and nervousness gone when he saw the pirate captain collapse. We have money this time. We're customers. Jin yelled at Patty who just stared down at them haughtily. Don't be ridiculous. Hey, contact the Navy right away. Patty said, pointing to a random cook. What? Jin began sweating more. If the Navy arrived now it would truly be the end of the Krieg pirates. And right after we escaped that monster. He's at his weakest right now. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Patty exclaimed, putting his hands on his hips as he grinned gleefully. There's no need to feed him anything. Keep him under arrest. He's right. We don't know what he'll do once his energy's back. He's done bad things, he deserves to starve because of everything he's done. Once he's back to normal, I bet he'll attack this restaurant straight away. There's no need to give him even a glass of water. A cook said with crossed arms as he glared at the pair of pirates, Jin losing hope fast only to turn to his captain in shock. I won't do anything. Once I eat, I promise I'll leave quietly. Don Krieg said, prostrating himself with his head down submissively. P please, help, me. Don Krieg, please stop. Stop begging. It's not something you should do. Jin protested against his captain's disgraceful display with pain in his eyes, the towering man of power he served reduced to this. I promise, please, I'll take leftovers or anything, anything. Huh? Are you trying to gain our sympathy? Patty asked incredulously, not noticing Sanji had come out of the kitchen. Out of the way, Patty. Not waiting for the man to move on his own, Sanji slammed Patty's head into the pillar behind the man with a kick, knocking him out and sending him flying down the stairs. S. Sanji. Jin muttered as he saw the cook who saved him from starvation just a few days prior make his way towards them with a large serving of fried rice, pork it seemed, chow fan perhaps. Here, Jin. Let him eat it, Sanji said coolly as he put down the meal in front of Don Krieg. Th thank you, Don Krieg thanked before shoveling the food into his mouth. Hey, Sanji, take that food away from that man this instant. The shorter cook with dark shades from earlier demands. Do you realize what kind of man he is? He's the man who's called the East Blue Ruler, foul play Krieg. Dark shades started going on about Krieg's backstory, how he started in a prison where he pretended to be a marine soldier before taking over a navy ship by killing the senior navy officer. How Krieg would fly marine flags to enter into the harbor without alerting anyone in order to attack the towns and passenger ships, even raising a white flag and then attacking enemy ships. 
He did anything to continue winning which is what brought him to where he was now. Leaving after eating. That's not possible with him. Dark Shades answered his own question with fury. Letting such a wicked fiend die without help is for society's sake. Then quicker than Sanji expected, Krieg stood and swung his arm at the blonde sous chef, knocking him down into the floor. Jin, the patrons, and Sanji's fellow cooks watching his sprawled out form in mixtures of shock, fear and worry. Luffy who'd been watching the whole time growled quietly in the background as his pupils shifted to shining gold but he made no move to interfere, yet. The fear eventually broke on of the patrons, who screamed in fright before running away, the other patrons following suit. Th this isn't what we agreed, Don Krieg. I brought you here under the condition that you wouldn't touch this restaurant. Jin yelled at his captain, reproachfully. And that man saved our lives. Before Jin could continue however, Krieg lifted the man up by his shoulder. Yeah, that was delicious. Snap. Jin's shoulder was crushed in Krieg's grasp. I feel alive again. Krieg hummed to himself as he observed the ship, his eyes pausing briefly at the straw hats who remained seated, before smiling approvingly. This is a good restaurant. I'll take this ship, Krieg declared. So, that's what you want, Sanji muttered, blood running down from his mouth. My ship became a wreck, so I wanted a new one, Krieg said, explaining his desire for the ship. You get off this ship after you take care of what I tell you to do. WH what? Dark shades glared through his glasses as a tick mark appeared in his temple. Don Krieg, this isn't what you promised. Jin groaned out as he glared up at his captain who ignored him. There are about 100 of my underlings still alive on my ship. They're weak with hunger and severe injuries. First, prepare 100 meals and water for them. There are some who've already starved to death. Krieg demanded. Bring them over immediately. You're telling us to revive pirates just so they can attack us. Dark Shades yelled out angrily. We refuse. Refuse. Don't get the wrong idea. I'm not placing an order. I'm giving you orders. Krieg clarified with ice-cold fury. It doesn't matter who you are. Don't defy me. The cooks all broke out in cold sweats, fearing for their lives while Sanji just sat up and wiped the blood off his face. Calmly observing the pirate captain and his crumpled underling who looked betrayed. Neither the cooks nor Sanji noticed Chef Zef coming down from the kitchen with a sack over his shoulder until he dropped it right in front of Krieg. Thud. Zef looked at the infamous man with a tired glare. There's enough food here for the 100 starving pirates on your ship. Take it and leave. Zef said coldly. Oh owner Zef. The cooks screamed out in shock, as Krieg's eyes sparked in recognition. Zef. Krieg muttered in disbelief. No, it couldn't be, could it? He's right, Owner Zef. Why would you do this? Owner Zef, explain yourself. Owner Zef, what are you doing? If you give them food, they'll kill us all. If they still have the will to fight, that is, Zef said calmly, effectively cutting off all protests as his cooks looked to him in confusion. Zef turned back to Krieg as he continued, right, defeated warrior of the Grand Line. Krieg's grimace was all the answer the cooks needed. See, can't be, Don Krieg is a, defeated warrior. Then even the ruler of the East Blue couldn't, even the pirate fleet with fifty ships couldn't sail across. You, you're red-legged Zeph, aren't you? Krieg said in a mixture of awe and disbelief with wide eyes. So you're alive, the incomparable pirate who was a cook and yet also a captain. So what if I'm alive? It has nothing to do with you. Zeph replied boredly. As you can see, I live as a cook now. Ha 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 ha. If you put it that way, it sounds nice, though rather than living as a cook, it looks like you can only live as a cook. Krieg jeered. Red-legged Zeph was a master of kicks who never used his hands in battle. His strong legs, capable of crushing bedrock and even leaving footprints on steel. The red leg epithet gained from your shoes being covered in the blood of your foes that spattered as you kicked your enemies down. But you no longer have that precious leg of yours, Krieg grinned arrogantly. How unlucky for you to have an accident at sea, losing one of your legs meant losing the ability to fight on. So, I can cook without a leg as long as I have these hands. Zeph stated, presenting his prized hands to the pirate captain. Cut to the chase already Krieg. What is it you want? Red leg Zeph. You're the man who once entered the Grand Line and came back unhurt, Krieg began as his eyes burned with ambitious light. There should be a logbook with the full year of your journey chronicled in it, give that to me. You've got to be kidding me, Luffy shook his head and crossed his arms as his opinion of Krieg was cemented, utterly pathetic and useless. Nami and Zoro had come to similar thoughts and conclusions and adopted similar expressions, Usopp on the other hand looked somewhat confused at his friend's disappointed expressions. Luffy noticed and would have explained but kept his peace, having a feeling that Zeph would cover it anyway. My logbook huh, yeah, I have it with me. Zef admitted still looking at Krieg dully, as if he wasn't worth much of the old chef's time. But I can't give it to you. Krieg, who'd been smiling like he'd won the lottery, frowned upon hearing the chef's decision. The logbook is the pride of all the crewmen that I traveled with. It's too important to give to you or anyone else for that matter. Zef explained. Then, I'll just take it from you by force. Krieg declared, raising a fist to close it in front of him. Is that supposed to be menacing or something? Luffy wondered before Krieg continued. It's true that I fell from the Grand Line. Even if that's the case, I'm still Don Krieg, the strongest man. It's merely a dark sea route. To sail across it, I have enough power, forces as well as ambition. Krieg paused briefly in his speech before continuing, the only thing I lacked was information, I just didn't know things. 
I'll take your logbook and then I'll form a large pirate fleet again, and seize the One Piece. And then, I'll stand on top in this great pirate era. Krieg finished with a flourish as he dramatically swept the raised fist to the side, causing his cape to flow briefly. What a petulant child, Luffy said, leaning back against his seat as he gave Krieg a disappointed look. The comment froze the blood of all the cooks still present, except for Sanji, who observed the wolfman from the corner of his eye and Zeph, who continued to look at Krieg like the 40-year-old pirate was nothing more than a minor inconvenience. What was that? Krieg asked coldly, leveling a dark glare at the young man. I said, what a petulant child. Maybe you need your ears checked as well, old timer. Luffy's words aggravated Krieg who grit his teeth. First of all, strongest man. Last I checked that was Edward Newgate, aka Whitebeard, one of the four emperors of the sea. Second, while information is definitely something you need for any sea voyage, getting Chef Zeph's logbook wouldn't do much for you, the Grand Line is known for its unpredictability because there is no rhyme or reason to its patterns so whatever he went through sure as hell ain't gonna be what you'll go through. Third, honestly what are you twelve? Clenching a raised fist at us as if that were menacing, constantly demanding everything, forcing dramatic scenes with exaggerated poses. On a young teen or man I'm pretty sure everyone would just roll their eyes or laugh but on a geezer like you. Luffy's smirk and sheer flippancy made Creed more incensed than he'd ever felt in his entire life. So enraged the old pirate was that his face skipped red and went straight to purple, unfortunately that only served to amuse Luffy even more. Oh hey, didn't think there was an eggplant man. Seems like a pretty useless devil fruit though. Please don't bother him, Luffy. Nami said admonishingly, causing Creed to smirk, his rage still simmering but pride recovered as the young attractive woman was clear on her and the buffoon's place. Honestly, dear, wasting your time on degenerated fossils. You have much bigger fish to fry than this decrepit pillock. Want to run that by me again, bitch? I'll bend you over right here and, Krieg's vulgar words were cut off as Luffy shaved in front of him, delivering a devastating blow to the taller man's stomach with a glowing silver fist. The, descent of the king, enhancement technique, injecting rippling waves into Krieg's body to go on a rampage, battering him from the inside, causing him to cough up a worryingly large amount of blood. How did you? Uninterested in explaining or even having to spend any minute longer with Krieg in his presence, Luffy wordlessly slammed both his hands onto the sides of Krieg's skull, rippling waves rupturing the man's eardrums continuing its onslaught in his brain case. There was a pause of silence before Krieg fell on his knees and screamed as blood rushed out his auditory canals and his mind racked in pain. Jin looked to his side in horror seeing his captain's state after just a few seconds. W-H what the hell? H-he just what did he even do? He incapacitated Don Krieg in an instant. Luffy ignored the looks and comments in favor of delivering a savage kick to Krieg's face. Crack. Breaking foul play Krieg's nose, the kick also lifted the man off his feet and out the restaurant, flying through the air before crashing into his ship, breaking the saber-toothed cat figurehead on the way. Like Chef Zef said, take it and leave. Luffy told Jin coolly as he nudged the sack of food towards the shocked and horrified vice captain. Sanji, willing as I am to wait for you to repay whatever debt you have I do have other appointments to attend to. I'm honestly surprised you stuck around as long as you have, flattering, honestly. Sanji said with a smirk as he placed an unlit cigarette between his lips. Unfortunately, I'm still staying until. Just go, Sanji. I don't need you here as my sous chef. Zef said with a sigh as he rubbed his eyes tiredly. You go out there and achieve our dream, find that which we sought, what any true seafaring cook seeks. Quote dot dot dot. I'm not leaving till you keel over, old geezer. Sanji replied stubbornly causing Zef's tiredness to evaporate into exasperation as he moved to open his mouth only to close it as the cooks and Jin all began shouting asking for explanations as to how and why Sanji, Zef, Luffy and the Straw Hats weren't freaking out about what the wolfman had done to Krieg. Jeez Jin, I called him Emperor's son didn't I? Sanji said with a sigh as he gazed down at a lighter longingly, his eyes lighting up when Luffy pulled out a smoke filter mask and gave a thumbs up. Figured it was torture for ya. Luffy shrugged nonchalantly as Sanji lit his cigarette and took a deep breath, a concerningly deep breath. Oi oi, you burn through half the cancer stick in one go. How are you so nonchalant? The cooks cried out indignantly, the Krieg vice captain standing now, the bag of food slung over his good shoulder silently agreeing with the cooks with a confused glance at the straw-hatted man. He's the son of an emperor and he named dropped Whitebeard, one of the four emperors in the New World, in the second half of the Grand Line earlier. Zoro stated, wearing noise-canceling headphones, the kind used by construction workers with heavy-duty equipment. He's seen and lived among pirates stronger than anyone in the East Blue, people like Krieg are nothing but fodder to him. Now the cooks and Jin just silently gaped at Luffy who just ignored them as he looked at Zef waiting for the man to speak what he'd had meant before being interrupted. The cries of outrage and confusion giving him time to calm himself, Zef walked to stand right in front of the boy raised as his own. I ain't keeling over for at least a hundred more years so just go out there and sail the seas Woodaja, eggplant. Zef raised his hand to stop Sanji from protesting as he wasn't finished yet. I did not give you all the food while I crushed my leg for my own sustenance so you'd waste your life away repaying whatever debt you think you need to pay me. Gasps of shock and demands for explanations rang out and filled the restaurant, the sound bouncing off the walls and amplifying itself so much Luffy had run to Nami for his pair of heavy-duty headphones. The navigator already had them out and ready for the captain in advance much to the wolfman's relief. 
Zef sighed and sat everyone down so he'd be able to give them the explanation they wanted, Zoro and Luffy being able to hear the story as if it was being whispered to them. It wasn't ideal but the two would take that over having their ears ring for when the cooks would inevitably start shouting again. Jin had left in a panic after hearing Luffy was the son of one of the Yonko and thus was no longer in the restaurant to hear Sanji and Zef's tale. The tale began with a raid. Fresh from returning from the Grand Line, Red Leg Zef, captain of the Cook Pirates, led a raid on a passenger ship. A passenger ship Sanji had been working in as a chore boy for the kitchen staff. During the raid, a young naive Sanji stood up against the Cook Pirates, thinking fighting would be his best chance at survival, clearly it was not. Zef himself had taken to dealing with the young Sanji but the lad wouldn't give up, refusing to accept dying there, dying without fulfilling his dream of reaching the All Blue. But Zef didn't need to kill the boy, he wasn't even a threat after all, so he ordered his crew to withdraw as the storm that followed was larger than anticipated. Before the cook pirates could leave however, a massive wave, the first of many, crashed against the passenger ship and carried the young Sanji away into the ocean depths with it. Much to the dismay and confusion of his crew, Zef leapt into action to save the boy, unaware of the tragedy that would follow. The morning after, Sanji awoke to find himself stranded on a small land formation, Zef a few feet away from him with two sacks, one larger than the other. Zef gave the smaller sack to Sanji and left to the other side of the island with the larger one for himself after giving Sanji some advice on budgeting his food and orders to remain on that side of the island, only bothering Zef if a ship was called over. Sanji had been given five days worth of food, and he was to make the most out of it. Begrudgingly accepting Zef's advice Sanji budgeted his food and made five days work into one day short of three weeks. In those three weeks only one ship passed by and try as he might, the ship was too far away to notice Sanji's calls for rescue. From there days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months, and ten days into the third month Sanji disobeyed Zef's orders and made his way to the captain's side of the island. It was on the seventieth day, forty-five days after he'd lost all his food, that Sanji approached Zef in hopes of getting food from the large sack Zef had with him, clinging to the faint possibility there may be even just a few scraps left. What Sanji found however was a bag full of treasure and a pirate renowned for fighting only with his legs, no longer having his left leg. Sanji confronted Zef. Why? Why would he sacrifice his own leg to sustain himself to help someone who tried to kill him? Zef's answer. Because they shared the same dream. The old cook pirate captain may not have found the all blue in his one year voyage on the Grand Line, but he never once believed it was not out there. With his crew gone however, he would never set sail to search for it again, they may not have believed the all blue existed but they were his beloved comrades, his dear family all the same and to sail without them was unthinkable. So he decided to entrust his dream to the young Spitfire placing all his faith into the little runt who'd been crazy enough to stand up and fight. Zef then shared a different dream, another ambition he had, one that he'd gained while sailing the seas and gone through periods without meals as well. A restaurant on the seas, where any sailor could go to eat, be they marine, pirate or just a regular Joe, if they wanted to eat, he'd let them in to eat. It was at this point where Zef's body and resolve finally began to crack causing Sanji to burst into defiant tears like any selfish child who desired something but was being refused. The boy made an oath, an oath to make the old man's dream of a sea restaurant a reality. Zef was touched but he never was one for emotional crap so he taunted the young Sanji, getting a laugh after the boy's predictable outburst and string of curses. Fifteen days later, on the 85th day of being stranded, they were found and they were rescued. From there, Sanji upheld his oath and worked tirelessly alongside Zef to make the ex-pirate's dream of a restaurant on the seas a reality. Nine years later, the restaurant is renowned for its mouthwatering dishes, and nine years later it was time for Sanji to leave. I'm not, Sanji began protesting once more but was cut off yet again, this time by Luffy. You're telling me you're paying your, debt? by sticking around and helping Zef run his already successful, well-known restaurant. Luffy said with a blank face. A blank face that quickly became exasperation. You're one of the biggest dumbasses I've ever met. That mean we can get a different cook? Zoro asked excitedly, ignoring Sanji's squawks of anger. Your flirting's a deal breaker for me. Not to mention the fact you look like a guy who wouldn't dare to ever harm a woman no matter what the circumstances. Zoro, he can't be that ba. Usopp waved his hand dismissively at what had to be the dumbest thing he'd heard. Hitting women was obviously bad but like not hitting an enemy pirate or marine cause they were a woman. No one's that. Naturally, all women are queens, Sanji declared, glaring at Zoro, daring the swordsman to deny it. The swordsman, wolfman, and marksman collectively facepalmed while the navigator, the navigator was too dumbfounded to comment or actually make any actions. He won't hit a woman but he will find non-harmful ways of dealing with them. Zef stated with tired eyes, clearly the man had to deal with a lot because of Sanji's aversion to harming women. Last time a female pirate came around to start trouble he managed to deal with her by tying her up. How'd he manage that if he can't even hurt them? Zoro asked, unsure if he even wanted to know the answer. Somehow he managed to pull it off after grabbing her hands and pulling her into a dance, the tango I believe. Zef answered with a hint of mirth in his eyes. Eggplant still won't explain how he'd managed to get the ropes around the woman without her noticing or any of us actually seeing it until it was over. Quote dot dot dot. So he's a magician too. Luffy jumped up and down excitedly. Please let me take him, Chef Zef. We'll sail to the ends of the earth and beyond to find the all blue. The wolfman stopped jumping around like a child on Christmas Eve and stood next to the blonde man, slinging an arm around the sous chef's shoulder. 
And when we're done, we'll bring your son right back to catch up. Maybe even get him to settle down with someone so he'll calm down along the way. Luffy. Don't make decision for M. Deal. Take him. He's all yours. Zeph exclaimed, stomping on a certain plank of wood that actually descended, like a button. Plomp. Here's the lad's clothes as well as some utensils and ingredients. Take this perverted idiot son of mine to the seas and let him accomplish our dream. Whatever protest Sanji had died in his throat hearing Zeph acknowledgement of him being the old pirate's son. You sail the seas and find the all blue, you learn all you can as a cook on your travels, and when you're done, Zeph paused to walk closer to the boy he's raised for the past nine years. When you're done, you come home. Luffy stepped back as the chef threw his arms around Sanji who looked too shaken to respond verbally, both men's eyes watering but neither shedding tears as the younger chef also threw his hands around his mentor, his father. I will. Sanji promised. I'll find the all blue, I'll become the greatest chef in the world and learn every dish I can on my journey, and then I'll come home, dad. The Bharati 3 The Honorable Duel, The Anticlimactic Conclusion and, Nami's Betrayal? No one's pov while the two blonde chefs had their moment, the cooks, and Usopp, around them brought out napkins and dabbed their eyes at the touching scene. Nami and Zoro shared a glance and chuckled, patting their touched marksmen on the back. The swordsman's good mood turned to confusion however, as the lack of a certain raven-haired captain dawned on him. Where's? Zoro's eyes landed on the captain who was turned away from the scene, shaking. Luffy, is everything. The swordsman's questions died in his throat when he heard something, beautiful. A sound similar to the one he made when he practiced, swinging his sword, cutting through the breeze. No it was the sound of a sword cutting through the breeze, but, different, perfect. Creak, crash, crash, crash. The sound of wood creaking and objects crashing into the seas filled the restaurant, breaking the touching moment between the two blondes as the sea restaurant began to shake violently. Zeph began shouting orders around to his staff to keep the ship afloat while the Krieg pirate's galleon outside sank into the depths. Luffy, who'd still been shaking, inhaled deeply before exhaling slowly, turning to his crew with a glare. Nami, stay behind me and stay away from the fight. Usopp, hang back and keep an eye out for wherever Johnny and Yosaku might be. They will probably arrive shortly. Zoro, Luffy had given his orders clearly and concisely without wavering once, until he turned to his swordsman. Remember who you are, and where you currently stand. Nami and Usopp turned to each other with raised brows, while Zoro nodded as he followed his captain out the Barati, and into a massacre, a lone figure in the distance stood on a small boat of sorts, with a drawn sword. It's him. It's really him. Zoro uttered to himself, shaking in delight while Usopp and Nami surveyed the wreckage around them with gaped mouths. Yeah, it is, Luffy said with a half-lidded gaze, his eyes shadowed by the brim of his father's hat. The mist parted with Luffy's words, the figure on the ship becoming clearer just as Sanji, Zeph and the Barati workers started filling out the restaurant. Zeph staggered and stood ramrod straight as he took in the man's features. A lean man with black hair, a short beard, mustache, and sideburns that pointed upwards. His most striking facial features were his eyes, sharp yellow eyes that seemed to pierce deep into one's soul, a hawk's eyes. A predator's eyes. The man wore an open black coat with red, flower-patterned sleeves and collar, white pants held up by a decorated belt and tucked into large boots. A crucifix pendant around his neck, and on his head rested a wide-brimmed hat decorated with a large plume, giving him the likeness of a Spanish swordsman. The sword he wielded looked like one from the west, a cruciform and well-ornate weapon with a curved single-edged, black blade resembling an oversized Kriegsmesser. The greatest swordsman in the world, one of the seven warlords of the sea, rival of Red Hair Shanks himself, Dracul Mahop. Luffy said as he locked eyes with the man on the coffin-like boat that glowed ominously with the spectral green flames that burned on large candles at the man's side. Big Bro Zoro. Nami and Usopp turned back to the restaurant to see Johnny and Yosaku had arrived, and were clearly frazzled if their haggard appearances and greedy gasps for air were any indication. The swordsman paid them no mind however as he watched Hawkeye's ship sail closer. Zoro stepped forward and began making his way towards the man he idolized and aspired to defeat, to claim the title he seeked, to complete his oath to her. The green-haired swordsman began to sweat as he came closer and closer, the power of the other swordsman exuding outwards and engulfing him like a tsunami. Remember who you are, and where you currently stand. Luffy's words echoed in his head amidst the confused, angry cries of the Creed pirates who cursed the warlord's name. One of the pirates drew his two sidearms, flintlocks, and fired both at the hawk-eyed swordsman who didn't even turn. Instead he lifted his blade to the side and tilted it ever so slightly, adjusting the trajectory and thus averting them away from him. W-H what? I aimed straight at him. The blonde dreadlock pirate said angrily. He averted them. Zoro explained, calmly continuing while the man gasped in shock and backed away from him, not realizing the green-haired swordsman was there until Zoro was right behind him. He gently changed the course of the bullets using the point of his sword. That can't be true, Blonde Dreadlock argued, his mind refusing to accept that such a thing was possible. Zoro walked past him indifferently, disregarding his protest. Hey, who are you? Three swords, could it be, a bald pirate, save for a small patch of orange hair slicked backwards, muttered staring at Zoro's blades. I've never seen a sword move so gently, Zoro said, oozing with admiration and respect. Mahawk broke his gaze with Luffy to glance at the newcomer, the swordsman who was by the man's side earlier. There is no strength in swordplay based only on force, Mahawk said watching Zoro dismissively. 
That's the blade you used to slice up this ship as well, isn't it? Zoro questioned, his eyes lit with resolve that burned like wildfire. It is, Mahak answered, still not having much interest in the younger swordsman. I set out to sea to meet you, Zoro said, removing his bandana from his bicep to tie around his head. Your purpose? Mahak questioned, a little spark of curiosity now present in his eyes. To become the strongest, Zoro answered simply, grinning widely. HMPH, how foolish. Mahak smirked, amused by the greenhorn's display. You must have time to spare if you're here in the East Blue. Let's fight, Zoro declared unsheathing Wado Ichimanji. Th this guy is Zoro. Roar Noah Zoro of the Three Swords style, blonde dreadlock exclaimed, to the shock of his fellow Krieg pirates. Don Krieg himself leaned over a railing as a man, a doctor presumably, attended him to watch the pirate hunter with interest. Z Zoro's gonna fight him, Usopp yelled, clearly in protest. L Luffy, you have to stop him. Zoro can't. This is Zoro's dream, Usopp. Nami stated coolly, her fists tightening at her sides as she realized what Luffy's strange words to Zoro actually meant. Luffy won't interfere with his or any other friend's dreams, no matter the consequences. Th that's crazy, he's going to die, Usopp screamed only to be attacked from behind by enraged bounty hunters. You saying big bro Zoro's weak, huh, Johnny growled. Take back what you're insinuating, Usopp, Yosaku demanded. Zoro won't die, Luffy said coldly, causing Johnny and Yosaku to grin happily, thinking Usopp would get what's coming to him for doubting Zoro. Probably, Johnny and Yosaku blanched, he definitely won't win. Johnny and Yosaku began protesting once more but two swift slams from Nami's staff ended it. Quote dot dot dot. If Zoro falls, what will you do, Luffy? Nami asked, worry painfully evident in her voice. Luffy didn't answer her, not verbally anyway. The drop in temperature spoke more volumes than any words ever could have. Fight. HMPH. How pitiful. Week 1, Mahawk, to everyone aside from Zeph, Sanji and the Straw Hat Gang, disappeared and reappeared a little ways away from Zoro's right with crossed arms. To Zeph and Sanji, they saw Mahawk tense and jump before blurring, but to the Straw Hats, they saw it as a powerful leap. To Luffy, in specific, Mahawk's jump was but a slow gentle hop. You should be able to see the disparity in our abilities even before we cross swords. Is it your courage or ignorance that causes you to turn your sword on me? It's ambition that drives me. Zoro answered, placing Wado Ichimanji in his mouth before drawing his other two blades. And it's also because of a promise I made to one I hold dear. Mahawk, leveled his cold indifferent glare at Zoro briefly, before plucking his cross necklace off his neck, removing the longer bottom section, revealing it to be a small blade, a kogatana. One does not use a cannon when hunting a rabbit, Mahawk said impassively, gauging Zoro's reaction. The two screaming buffoons from earlier already proving themselves incompetent as they began screaming and sputtering in protest once more. Imbeciles. Even if you're a swordsman who's earned a bit of a name for himself, this sea, the East Blue, is the weakest among the four. Deciding to play up his taunt game, Mahawk leaned back slightly as he pouted at Zoro sadly. Unfortunately, I don't carry any smaller sharp instrument than this one. Bastard, you'll regret this day. Big bro Zoro will wipe the floor with you. You hear me. In other words, prove myself worthy to fight you at your best. Zoro's calm assessment threw Mahawk for a loop for a second before the man collected himself as Zoro rushed to engage. Perhaps there was a wolf pup among the harmless sheep. Mahawk thought with a smirk that came and went in a flash. Onijiri, Zoro wasted no time and brought out his strongest right out the gate knowing only his best would have any chance against this opponent. To the shock of Johnny and Yosaku however, the technique that had never failed to hit its mark and end any it had been used on had been stopped. Stopped by a small blade thrust right where the three blades Zoro wielded connected. But a pup is alas, just that. A pup, Mahawk concluded as Zoro proceeded to assault him with a flurry of slashes, each one either blocked or sidestepped with laughable ease. Johnny and Yosaku began to sweat as they begged Zoro to get serious, refusing to believe their big bro could ever be outclassed like this. What ferocity your swordplay has, Mahawk commented as he continued to gauge the young swordsman's actions. Calm enough to not lose it completely, he advances forward testing for cracks or patterns, you're not a mindless beast so what is it that drives you to your death, young man? On and on their dance continued, Mahawk leading Zoro through each succeeding step with every block and evasion, their audience enraptured by the spectacle, unable to turn away as the man feared as the best in the East Blue was made nothing more than a toddler in comparison to the one recognized as the best in all the world. A memory of Kuina played in Zoro's mind with every few failures in hitting his mark. The duels they had, the rivalry, the friendship, the promise. It was in these moments where Zoro would be ever so slightly slower, moments Hawkeye used to attack the young man himself, never using the Kogatana itself but instead chops or thrusts from his hand. What do you bear on your shoulder? Mahawk asked, genuinely curious as to what drove the greenhorn. What do you desire once you've obtained power, week one? I can't lose, Zoro muttered, the calm he retained had waned with each dodge and deflection Mahawk countered with and the memories of Kuina were joined with more recent ones. Meeting Luffy and the others. Fighting alongside them. Training with them. Tiger, the Pirate King wouldn't have anything but the best, I've decided you're joining my crew, trap. Zoro's blades hadn't finished their descent by the time Mahawk thrust his small kogatana into Zoro's chest, right where his heart is. 
Time seemed to freeze as Johnny and Yosaku moved to jump towards Zoro, only held back by Luffy who kept them from going further by pinning them down into the deck. Nami felt breathless as memories of the past resurfaced, a helpless, outclassed individual on the verge of death, their life in the hands of one who stood far above them. Usopp screamed, moving to notch an arrow only to fall onto his knees as a pressure slammed down on him, his captain seeming much, much larger as his form seemed to eclipse everything around him, daring him to intervene. Drip, drip, are you just going to let me pierce your heart? Mahawk asked, why aren't you withdrawing? I, if I step back now, all the promises, oaths or vows I made in the past will be shattered, and I will never be able to return to where I am now, Zoro's answer began as a mutter, before it became a composed and sure statement. Yes, that's what defeat is about. Then, all the more reason I can't withdraw. Even if you'll die, all for honor, better than living without it. Zoro's conviction struck a chord in Mahawk, the older swordsman's face breaking out of impassiveness and into disbelief ever so briefly. Pulling his kogaton out of Zoro's chest, Mahawk took several steps back, sheathing the small blade and ordering Zoro. Young man, state your name. In response, Zoro took on a new stance, both fists pushed out straight in front of him, the right blade pointed downwards and the left upwards, both tilting to the left. Roronoa, Zoro. Responding in kind, Mahak unsheathed his black blade once more, I'll remember it. I haven't seen anyone like you in a while, strong one. Thus, as a swordsman's courtesy, I will end this with the world's strongest black sword. I appreciate it, Zoro responded gratefully. This is it, I comma I won't win this. No cracks or slip-ups ever appeared when he assaulted Mahak with his flurry of slashes. Zoro began rotating his blades unknowingly coating them in a black sheen, armament hockey, three swords style secret technique. Remember who you are, and where you currently stand. Fall. Mahawk declared as he leapt towards Zoro, eyeing the blackened blades curiously. Armament hockey in the east blue of all places. Three thousand worlds. The sound the two spinning blades Zoro made was, unsatisfying, as if they were cheap knockoffs of a real blade, but that didn't make sense. At least until Mahawk's own blade flowed through the air as the two swordsmen rushed past each other, a beat of silence, and then. Shatter. Splurk. Zoro's two handheld blades broke, only small blades near the base remaining, the black sheen fading away and a diagonal cut from his lower left hip to his upper right shoulder spurted out blood as the young swordsman fell onto his knees. So this, this is the power of the world's strongest, Zoro stated, calmly removing Wado Ikimanji from between his teeth and returning the blade back into its sheath. Standing back up, Zoro turned to Mahawk, and spread his arms outward. What are you? Mahawk once again lost his cold indifferent composure as he was puzzled by the action, waiting for the young man to explain himself. Scars on the back are a swordsman's shame. Zoro explained with a grin, bloody and battered yet still exuding resolve. This was the world's strongest. So be it. Perhaps not today. Perhaps not tomorrow. But someday, some tomorrow, he will face Dracul Mahawk once again, and he will be the world's strongest. Admirable. Once more, the beautiful, perfect sound of a blade cutting through the breeze reached his ears. To make such a sound with every swing of his own blade, that was his next step Zoro decided. It would be his next step to achieving his goal. And as he resolved to do just that, Mahawk's blade, Yuru, sliced Zoro's chest forming a new cut, from his upper right shoulder down to his lower left hip. A beat of silence passed yet again and then. S-P-L-U-R-K. Do not live too hastily, young man. Mahawk said as he began seeing the younger swordsman in a new light. Zoro. Blood burst forth and his name was screamed out, but by whom he was not sure. Kuina, forgive me, Zoro apologized to his dearly departed friend as the difference between him and the warlord became ever clearer, and his consciousness faded. My name won't reach the heavens, reach you, just, yet. This was Roronoa Zoro's last thought before unconsciousness took over and his body sank beneath the waves. Crash. The next few seconds were a blur. Nami jumped into the sea and swam towards the drowning swordsman with no hesitation, Johnny and Yosaku following suit after a beat of stunned silence. Sanji and Yusop made no moves, no one else did for that matter. Not the remaining Bharati cooks, not the scattered Krieg pirates, no one. All of them were frozen and their gazes locked on the tall young man with a straw hat as the temperature plummeted to absolute zero and they could hear it. The moment the captain who'd stood by to honor his vice captain's wishes, snapped. Luffy's Pav. I watched. I stood by and watched as my first mate, my best friend, one of my brothers fought against the greatest swordsman in the world. I stood by and watched as he learned how far he still had to go. I stood by and watched as despite the chasm becoming ever clearer, he never once truly lost control of himself. I stood by and watched as he accepted reality but still did not give up on his dream. I stood by and watched as he presented himself to be finished off from the front, because scars on the back would shame him till the end of time, I could no longer stand by and watch as he began sinking into the depths. Mahawk. The demonic voice shook everyone around us in their very souls but I didn't care. My mind was too far gone to register the fear I was causing to even my close friends. All that was on my mind was the image of one of my boys being cut down, and that was enough. My body erupted in black flames making me look like a comet hurtling towards Mahawk. The man who had been indifferent for most of his fight with my vice captain now looked on guard as he raised his blade to meet my fist, both the fist and the blade coated in armament hockey. Proper martial art techniques were normally better than uncoordinated brawling, but against him. 
My instincts screamed that unpredictable wild sequences posed more of a threat than choreographed movements against a man who'd held the title of greatest swordsman for so many years, and like always my instincts weren't wrong. The ease and grace at which he evaded, blocked and parried my swordsman was gone, as if it was never there. Instead of a leisurely dance, I pushed Mahawk back, whatever attack he moved to block would be pushed forward forcing him to either go with the momentum as a means of escape or attack. This was no dance, there was no rhyme or reason in it, just pure violence. Each time we clashed the air rippled as waves pushed outwards, the sky above us had split since the first exchange but neither of us had noticed. What the two of us focused on was the force emitting from our weapons. His blade, the strongest black blade in the world, Yuru, no longer just coated in a sheen of armament but exuded blackish red lightning. My fists continued burning with black flames that had begun affecting my clothes as well, black wisps curling and flickering around them. Strange. Mahawk commented observing my flames. I was told it would be silver, not black. I stopped in my advance hearing his words and moved to question him about where he learned that when I was pulled out of my blind rage. L. Luffy, can you hear me? Turning to my side I saw Nami, Johnny and Yosaku had pulled Zoro out of the sea and onto the bounty hunter duo's ship, my swordsman raising the one sword that hadn't broken in his last skirmish with Mahawk. I was quiet, dumbfounded for a moment before relief washed over me. Yeah, I hear you, Zoro. Did I worry you? You need no less than the world's greatest swordsman, right? Zoro asked, coughing up blood much to his rescuer's distress. Big bro, please don't talk anymore. Zoro, just shut up and, Nami tried to reprimand Zoro but the swordsman shifted his face towards her and she stopped. Zoro unsheathed Wado Aikimanji and thrust his treasured blade to the sky. I, I will not be defeated ever again, Zoro declared, swearing another oath, one that made my heart thud in my chest. Until the day I defeat him and become a master swordsman, I'll never be defeated. Got any problems with that, Pirate King? I didn't need to turn to know Mahawk and I shared the same shit-eating grin. Internally I berated myself for losing control like that, the sight of my comrade being hurt destroying all reasoning I had while valid would ultimately be a costly vulnerability, one I'll need to get over, again. Indeed, it is. Your display was quite embarrassing, pup. Ignoring the bastard within, I chuckled. Not at all. Hear me. Roranoa Zoro. My name is Dracul Mahawk. Mahawk yelled out, catching everyone's attention. It's still too early for you to die. Learn about yourself. Learn about the world, and become strong. No matter how many years it takes, I will hold this seed of the strongest and wait for you. Surpass this sword. Surpass me. Roranoa Zoro. Turning away from my first mate, Dracul Mahawk turned his gaze on me once more. What's your goal, Luffy? My eyes narrowed briefly before remembering just who this guy was, and once more I felt like an idiot for losing it. I'm sure you already know, Uncle Mahawk. I finished with a smirk, enjoying gasps and sputtering that followed from our audience. Mahawk just took it in stride and grinned. That's a goal even harder than surpassing me, boy. Mahawk remarked with an amused smirk. Nothing worth anything comes without a price. I replied simply as Zef and Sanji shared a look as they figured out why I called Mahawk, uncle. The rest of our audience didn't, however, but in Nami's case I'd give her a pass seeing as she was more concentrated on patching up the once again unconscious Zoro than actually listening to Mahawk and I's conversation. Hawkeye, Krieg thudded against the floating remains of his ship and glowered at Mahawk and I, didn't you come to take my life? The life of the East Blues ruler, Don Krieg. Seriously, this joker didn't get the memo when I ruptured his insides back in the restaurant. I shook my head as I threw a glare at Krieg, who'd crossed his arms and glared at us like the petulant child he was. No, actually I didn't. Mahawk dismissed Krieg so flippantly with an uninterested wave of his hand that it gave some of the Krieg pirates whiplash. I smirked seeing why, one moment we were locked in mortal combat, the next we heard heartwarming and awe-inspiring speeches and oaths, after that came some random comedic bit and now we were back to indifference. It kind of felt like being in a brain-dead author's story. You happened to be on the way to Luffy so I thought I might as well have some amusement. Now that I'm here though I've had enough of you. Oh, Mahawk was here to see me was he? You may have had enough, but I'm tired of getting beaten. Krieg's smug personality put his underlings on edge as they began voicing their concern over his sanity. Die before you leave. Krieg pulled out two twin barrel pistols and activated his armor's hidden weapons. Fucking pest. Gathering energy in my wrists I slammed one behind the other, releasing a shockwave that not only took care of Krieg's bullets but a good chunk of his remaining galleon as well. TCH. Bastard turned and ran. Krieg grumbled not seeing Mahawk had shaved to stand behind Zef with a disappointed shake of his head. Krieg didn't even seem to realize the shockwave came from me. Looks like Mahawk's gonna get some lunch while I take care of this dumbass. I mused as Nami and the bounty hunter duo made their way to the going merry with a heavily bandaged Zoro, scarred and unconscious but alive. Boys we had some interference but now, we're taking that ship for our own, Krieg declared, getting mixed reactions from his crew. Some cheered in approval while others shot him looks like he was crazy. Don, a familiar voice cried out in distress, it was Jin. Didn't you see what the kid just did? How he fucked you up in the restaurant? All looks like there's at least one person who isn't a complete ape. I was caught off guard, Jin. I, foul play Krieg, had been, he he foul played. Krieg started with an amused smirk, deluding himself into thinking it was so. A younger man getting the drop on him with underhanded tactics of his own. Dot can we just kill him already? 
It's very tempting. Oh how very tempting indeed. The delusional twa kept spouting off more plans on what the Creed pirates would do after taking command of the Bharati. Using the Bharati's funny appearance as a means of getting others to lower their guards, their tried and true raising the white flag then backstab strategy etc. My eyes narrowed and my blood boiled as I snarled seeing Creed raise his gun and shoot one of his subordinates. Jin discreetly dove after the poor man, who'd just asked what Creed had planned if they met someone like Mahawk again. Still afraid of someone like that? Huh, Creed demanded rhetorically. You think an ordinary human can slice up a large sailing ship? Dracul Mahawk clearly has the power of a devil fruit. Although those with devil fruit powers are considered by society to be legends, the Grand Line is crawling with them. Mahawk obviously used some strange power to slice up the ship. Creed explained, nursing his wounded pride by badgering Mahawk's reputation, something that ticked me off greatly. That straw hat bastard is the same. Some strange power that causes damage to someone's insides, same reason he had those black flames. Red Leg Zef is a pirate who sailed the Grand Line for a whole year and as such must have had some way of dealing with devil fruit users. Creed deduced, smugly turning to his crew who were eating up their captain's delusional bullcrap like it was Sanji's cooking. Darn now I'm hungry again. And those methods must be written in his logbook. If we're lucky, so is information on the, one piece. Out of the corner of my eye I watched as Sanji looked back at the restaurant with eyes lost in the past. The guy didn't even seem to notice Zef had gone inside after Mahawk tapped the old chef's shoulder, giving the former pirate captain a fright realizing who was standing behind him. Guess I'll be able to talk to Mahawk over lunch. Just because you know I'm a devil fruit user doesn't mean you figured out a way to deal with me you know. My comment dampened the cheery mood of the idiot pirates while Creed just continued smiling smugly. I've also had my fruit since I was a kid, so just dousing me with seawater won't work anymore. He he he, you seem to forget who I am. Creed chuckled as he seemed to reach for something behind him. I'll let me guess, he's gonna go for floating floorboards. Unfortunately for him though Patty and Dark Shades came around on some weird ship, wait a minute. The Barati's figurehead was its own ship. Admittedly I was impressed, wouldn't have ever expected the figurehead to be able to detach and be used as a warship. At the same time I wasn't really keen on having these two schmucks get involved. To me he's small fry, to you, yep, definitely out of your league. Patty and Dark Shades were able to deal with some of Krieg's underlings but the Don himself. The guy just lifted Patty and Dark Shades warship off the ocean and flung it towards the Barati like it was nothing. Before the warship could crash into the Barati whose resident cooks, plus Yusop, Johnny and Yosaku, started screaming and running around like headless chicken in a panic. Nami looked mildly concerned and glanced at me but I just nodded towards the warship as a particular blonde wasn't among the panicking cooks. Surprised there was space for them to run, oh the restaurant had, fins, for more space in case there was a surge of customers. Neat, how did I not notice them get deployed till now? Slam. Sanji leapt up and kicked the warship away from its initial course and into the seas beside the ship instead, shocking everyone around us into silence. Creed gasped recognizing the foot technique as I just grinned. Oh yeah, it's all coming together. Sanji, are you trying to kill Karne and I? Patty said indignantly as he burst out the sinking ship. Ah so dark shades is Karne, huh? I'll skin you alive you crazy bastard. Karne screamed, shaking his fist violently at Sanji who just lit up a cigarette before calmly responding. Yeah, don't, yeah, us, you crazy stew. Patty said back with shark teeth and white eyes. You almost lost powerful assets, you stupid spaghetti. Carne supplied glaring through his dark shades, pointing accusingly at Sanji, who just shrugged and stood guard waiting for Creed's next move. Chuckling, I shaved next to him and slung an arm around his shoulder with a grin. You and I are gonna get along real well when we set sail, Sanji. Shishishishishi, I chuckled as Sanji grinned back in amusement, eyes darting to the smoke filter mask I'd put back on. Long as I can still have a smoke, we'll get along just fine. Sanji replied, taking a deep one as he burned through the cancer stick. Oi! I sweat drop seeing him burn through another cigarette before pulling out another. I haven't had a decent smoke in almost a week. Sanji threw me a half-hearted glare as I just shook my head. You think you have time to make jokes? A soaked pirate said angrily as he made his way onto the ship's fins. Kill them all. That devil fruit user can't take us all on. I really could but I think I'll let Sanji and his friends have this one. And with that thought, I stood back to observe the fight between the Barati cooks and the Creed pirates. Sanji himself didn't jump into the fray but instead nudged me to Nami who was leading Johnny and Yosaku away, the two men carrying an unconscious Zoro. You're not going to check on him. He's your first mate isn't he? Sanji asked as if the two of us were discussing over lunch instead of being in between a battle. He's alive, Nami will handle the rest, I paused for a moment before giving out an order to my marksman. Usopp go along with them and stand guard. Johnny and Yosaku don't exactly instill me with confidence in keeping anyone safe. The archer nodded with a salute, what am first a marine, before going off to carry out his task, ignoring the outrage voiced by the two bounty hunters. I think you're going to be joining the fight now, I commented offhandedly as I sensed someone approaching from the waters below. Why's that? Sanji asked right before Patty came flying towards us. Now I could have been nice and caught him with my hands but, nah. One axe kick later and Patty is taking a nice little nap on the deck. Quote dot 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 quote. Sanji silently stared at me, eyes flickering over to Patty from time to time, as I whistled with my hands in my pockets. 
This mean I can kick Marimo's ass when I feel like it as well. Quote dot dot dot. Well if you two keep fighting that'll count as extended training so I don't see why not. Just what are you guys doing? An impressively tall man with dark green hair asked. He was a strange man with two large iron plates covering his front side and his back side as well as wielding two small plates with a large pearl in the center on each hand and elbow. The man chuckled before striking a pose, unassailable. Hence, invincible. When someone says, Pearl, the invincible shield of the Krieg pirates, they mean me. Great another weirdo, hey where's Jin? Ignoring Pearl's monologuing, I stretched out my senses to find out where the missing man was. When I did figure out where he was and the direction he was going in I was both incensed and amused. Well, we'll see if Usopp can deal with you or if I'll need to up his training. I turned my attention back into the fight just in time to see a ticked off Sanji kick a Krieg pirate away from Patty's unconscious form, Carne next to him in a similar state of unconsciousness as Patty. Wait when did Dark Shades get downed? Bong. Oof. That had to hurt. The poor bloke Sanji kicked away took a few of his mates with him straight into Pearl's front plate making one hell of a reverberating noise. A kitchen knife is a cook's soul. Sanji declared holding Patty's knife. Looks like the Krieg pirate tried to pull it off Patty's downed body. Don't you amateurs carelessly put your hands on it. S. Sanji. Patty muttered regaining consciousness long enough to take the offered knife back before fainting again, still holding the knife tightly. Is he actually fainting or just a drama queen? We won't be beaten by a mere cook. Some Krieg pirate said as he and a few of his pals charged Sanji. They didn't make it more than a few steps though after making that remark. With a whoosh, Sanji's form disappeared before a flurry of kicks sent them all flying. A mere cook, you say? I'm gonna cut you in three, you bastards, Sanji said with a death glare. Note to self, don't make any jabs about Sanji's position, or food in general. Ha, how impudent you are to beat them using only kicks. Pearl said with a laugh. Is that a policy of yours? To cooks, hands are most important. I can't have them hurt in battle. Sanji explained before thrusting out on foot towards Pearl tauntingly. I'll take you down with this leg as well. Take me down. That's impossible. Pearl said back with a confident smile. I'm an invincible man that won 61 of my battles unharmed. I've never shed blood in a battle, not even a drop. Pearl thrust his hands up as a twisted smug expression came upon his face. Honestly the guy had a pretty attractive face, long as he wasn't making faces like this and you know, not talking. Winning unharmed is the very proof of my power. Pearl emphasized his claim by smacking his two hand plates against each other. I'm a shield man and a gentleman. I'm refined, aren't I? Quote dot dot dot. How many screws loose does this fucker have? I couldn't help but utter as I witnessed this, I don't have the words to describe him honestly. You should be more aware of your surroundings, straw hat bastard. Without looking back I tilted my head to the side and let the spiked ball creep through at me sail past, straight towards Pearl. Boosh. Damn, he may be crazy but he can take a hit. A normal person would have had their head crushed if the spiked ball collided with their head but Pearl just staggered slightly. Ah shit. Krieg cursed under his breath, sounding more annoyed than apologetic. I sighed disappointedly at that. Another captain who only saw their crew was pawns on a chessboard. P. Pearl calm down okay. It's just a little blood A and it came from Don Krieg. He's the captain, it's only natural he'd be able to actually harm you. A Krieg pirate said nervously backing away from the shaking Pearl. Why yeah. It was also a sneak attack. So nothing on your record, he, another Krieg pirate supplied as Pearl touched his bleeding temple with a trembling hand before inspecting the bloody appendage. What the heck's with these guys' reactions? A cook voiced out his confusion behind us. Clang. 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 Calm down, Pearl, it's just a little bleeding. Don't lose your cool. Krieg commanded with frustration laced in his voice. Must not be the first time the refined gentleman acted this way. Clang. 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 What the heck is he about to do? Sanji wondered as I pressed my headset tighter against my ears as I grimaced. Geez even with these things the guy is bloody loud. Danger. 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 Out of nowhere white flames just erupted out of Pearl's plates as he threw his arms up in the air. Oh. No. It's started. A Krieg pirate shouted anxiously as another added. When Pearl gets upset, he catches fire. So this guy has a devil fruit. Wait no he just swam to get here so it can't be that. Those pearls in the center of his plate armor maybe. Fire pearls. Yep, it was the pearls. Special treat. And the flames burst forth igniting anything it landed on. The deck, other Krieg pirates, etc. Burn. With this flame and the flame shield, you have no idea how invincible I am. Pearl exclaimed with glee as his crew reprimanded him. After all, if the restaurant burned they wouldn't be able to commandeer it. No one steps into flames for they will burn. And so with this I am truly, invincible. Sanji however, proved Pearl's claim to be false as he jumped into the fire without an ounce of hesitation and attempted to deal a flying kick to Pearl's temple. The kick was blocked though as despite being contradicted Pearl wasn't shocked enough to not raise his arms up to defend himself. Dumbass. If I was afraid of flames, I'd be unfit to be chef. Sanji grinned as he held out a cigarette into the flames to light it. D damn it. What a refined guy he is. Pearl commented right before Sanji began his assault by going into a handstand to provide more momentum into his next kick which knocked Pearl down. Crazy bastard. Fine, how do you like these? Fire Pearl Barrage. 
Pearl threw out more fire pearls and hurled them towards the restaurant, Zef walking out with crossed arms. Ah, Chef Zef, look out. A Bharati cook shouted in worry, too wounded to get up and push his boss away from the line of fire. Owner Zef, take cover. Another cried out clutching their shoulder in pain. HMPH. Zef huffed before performing a swift spin kick, the gust generated from which blew out the flames of the fire pearls. Child's play. If Zef's here that means Mahawk's got in his order. Guess it's time to wrap this up. Now that it's come to this, I'll sink you all with the fins before the restaurant catches fire. Krieg declared pulling out a handheld cannon and firing it up to the sky, aiming for it to crash right between Pearl and Sanji, like hell that was gonna happen. Shaving up to the cannonball's apex of trajectory I grabbed the cannon and flung it back down next to Krieg, hitting the pillar next to him. Timber, I jokingly called out before noticing something, the pillar was gonna land right on. Bonk, gay heck, on down goes Pearl, pomp, landing next to Sanji, I sheepishly scratched the back of my head before apologizing. Sorry, I wasn't planning on interfering. Ah it's fine, the sooner we're done here the sooner we can set sail. Sanji waved it off with a smile. I grinned back at him happily before turning my attention to the side of the restaurant, still smiling. You really want to do this gin? I called out the man who remained behind the corner, hiding as he gathered his wits only to flinch at being found out. You can come out, I know you're there, I know you've got Nami with you too. There was a pause from everyone, even Krieg, before Jin walked out from behind the corner with one arm around Nami's neck holding her close and another pointing a gun to her head. Despite the precarious position however, Nami seemed completely calm, bored even, the same could not be said about Sanji. Jin, you dare handle a fair maiden in such a barbaric way. Disgraceful, Sanji roared as he, figuratively, burst into flames. Jin paused for a second before blinking in confusion, Krieg and his crew following suit. Zef and I just sighed and facepalmed. Sanji, they're pirates, and some of them are even rapists, for God's sake, they aren't going to care about using a woman as a hostage. Nami said with a shake of her head as she closed her eyes disappointedly, probably wondering if Sanji was worth the headache after all. Honestly I was having the same thoughts as well but then I noticed something, and grinned gleefully as I pointed it out. So, does anyone know where Sanji disappeared to? I asked looking around for the man who'd vanished into thin air, the rest of us, excluding Zef, doing the same. Jin blinked before panic and nervousness set in as his eyes darted around rapidly only to see the confused faces of his crewmates and opponents. The fuck, where'd Sanji go? Jin asked before the smell of cigarette smoke hit him hard and he was engulfed in the feeling of being locked on in a predator's gaze. Right behind you, Sanji slammed his foot down on Jin's head with a resounding boom, the Krieg vice captain's eyes shaking violently from the impact before his form crumpled down onto the floor. With the threat incapacitated, Sanji bowed theatrically to Nami who just stared at him blankly before turning to me and mouthed the word, shave, questioningly. Admittedly it would certainly seem like it since it looked like he teleported but, I grinned and shook my head side to side. I'll explain later, love. I promised Nami as Krieg started shaking violently, purple with rage and Pearl shook his head to get his bearings also getting back up to fight. Bout time I wrap this up. Correction, good sir. Pearl said, clanging his hand plates against one another once more, igniting them into pale flames. I will be the one wrapping this up. Ahahahaha. Ahahahaha. With this declaration Pearl rushed towards Sanji who just exhaled a long puff of smoke with a bored stare directed at the refined gentleman. Mouton shot. Sanji flipped up into the air towards Pearl before sending a flurry of kicks right to the towering man's face. He performed the technique so quickly Pearl hadn't even had time to block the attack this time and thus joined Jin in becoming a crumpled heap on the deck. Gah, must I do everything myself? Krieg roared angrily, bringing out a gas mask and plucking off one of his golden shoulder guards with a deep sneer. All of you drabble, move away. Don, that's that's, M, MH5, the strongest poison gas weapon. Several Krieg pirates joined in the panic, Sanji and Zef also beginning to look nervous as Krieg smugly prattled on and on about how, might makes right, and anything was fine as long as you won but the monologue bored me so I just focused on the tidbit mentioned earlier about poison gas. I have an idea, smiling smugly, Nami groaned and held her head in her hands recognizing the expression on my face, one she's dubbed, the crazy douchebag face. Apparently I make a certain expression when I plan on going out of my way to be a total ass, he he she ain't wrong. Deadly poison gas, MH5. Krieg shot a large red sphere that contained the deadly toxin with a crazed expression. A crazed expression that crumpled and turned to shock when he felt something go down his throat. Luffy, I can't tell whether to be proud of you or yell at you for being insane. Nami said tiredly as she rubbed her eyes watching Krieg in eyes position. The enemy pirates dropped their masks with horror painted on their faces as they witnessed the Don's face turn into a sickly purple shade and blood began streaming out his eyes. For context let me rewind the story back a few seconds to like the paragraph before the one before this one. Krieg fires MH5 containing an explosive sphere, I catch a toxic sphere and shave behind him, shoving it into his mouth and forcing him to swallow it and let it blow up inside him. Capiche, capiche. Who the hell are you talking to? I have no idea. Letting Krieg collapse on the ground as a twitching mess with blood pooling out every, and I mean every, orifice I stretched my body and cracked my neck a bit before giving my audience a chilling smile. The desired effect was instantaneous as the enemy pirates, and a few conscious Bharati cooks, paled in fear just before a spherical wave washed over the entire area. 
thud, 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 crash, thud, crash, crash. Ah, looks like some of them fell into the ocean, oh well. What the hell was that? Sanji demanded answers as he clutched a hand over where his heart would be, considerably paler than before and breathing very deeply. Zef wasn't much different but Nami. Nami just looked at me reprimanding, oh. I have a pretty good idea of why you let Jin get dust, doesn't mean I'm happy about it. Ah shit. Scratching my head sheepishly I did a quick sniff around before grinning happily as I shaved away to my target before shaving to Nami's front, presenting her with a large bag of gold, gems, and jewelry. The desired reaction was instantaneous. Belly symbols for eyes. You can test Usopp anytime, babe. For fuck's sake, what kind of woman did you fall in love with? I just laughed as Nami pecked me on the cheek with her arms around my neck, Sanji's desire for answers snuffed out as he fell on the deck with a depressive cloud over him. Also while he won't do anything to ruin a relationship he'll still be but hurt about it, shishishishishi. You were the chosen one. Usopp cried, pushing the door of the Bharati out dramatically. You were supposed to stop his insanity, not join it. Streams of tears cascaded down the archer's face as his eyes shined with hurt from betrayal. You were supposed to bring balance to our lives, not leave it in darkness. The marksman was covered in bandages. Looks like Jin did a number on him before he was brought down. You were my sister Nami, I trusted you. Nami paused in her inspection of the plunder briefly before she took out a crown and placed it on our head and twirled to Usopp with a sweet serene smile as she leaned back into my chest and purred, sorry sweetie, but Luffy's just, so much better. She drove the performance home by feeling up my abs, ah fuck. Single quote dot dot dot. Are you freaking kidding me? This is your kink. Oh shut up, it's not like I'm actually going to do anything like take away another guy's girl. I rolled my eyes and scoffed internally as I could feel the wolf bastard's disapproving glare. Little did I know that in the not-so-distant future, while I wouldn't take away a girl from a committed relationship, I do kind of steal her away from someone who'd been pining after her for years, oops. Luffy's pov. While Nami continued her inspection of the plunder, Jin came to and groggily took in his surroundings, stopping when his gaze fell on Don Krieg's twitching form that had begun spewing out gas along with the blood. Don Krieg. Stumbling forward to the incapacitated pirate captain, Jin's face was twisted in worry and disbelief before he turned to his crew. What happened? Who did this to him? Leaving Nami to continue her inspection and Usopp and Sanji to sulk, for different reasons, I walked over to the agitated vice captain to answer his question and finish things up. I did. Krieg pulled out a gas weapon called MH5 and shot it at us, probably would have been a death sentence to most of them as well. Jin paled a bit hearing the weapon, realizing he, Pearl and some of the other unconscious crew would have been killed as well without their gas masks. I just grabbed the sphere and shoved it down his throat though so he's the only one experiencing the effects, as you can see. Jin's mouth trembled slightly before it set in a firm smile and, to the shock of his crew, he kowtowed before me, planting his forehead down to the floorboards with a loud smack. You've proven yourself a stronger captain, please, Emperor's son, we surrender, we'll leave peacefully, I swear, Jin begged, pressing his forehead further down into the floorboards while his crew began protesting. Jin what are you doing, he may have beat Krieg but we can still take him. Emperor's son, then he's nothing but a snotty brat, no way are we surrendering to bastards like him. Gritting his teeth in frustration, Jin broke his submissive posture and raised his head to lash out at his crewmates. Quiet, all of ye. The crew's protest died down seeing the panic and fear in their vice captain's eyes, an expression they'd never seen before, even when Krieg was pissed at him. This ain't a snotty brat of some privileged shithead, this is the son of one of the four emperors of the sea. The rulers of the Grand Line. Gasps rang out from the Krieg pirates, and some of the Bharati cooks who hadn't known, before the enemy pirates began backing away from us, falling on their knees in despair and bursting into hysterics or still adamant about not surrendering. You'd bow to someone, Jin. The vice captain flinched before he turned around to see Krieg had stood up, clearly not all there with the pure white eyes and trembling form, and towered over him threateningly. You'd sully my reputation, the reputation of the Krieg pirates like this. You bastard, I'll rip you to pieces. All right, you're not worth even torturing. I decided, raising my hand up to his face and coating it in armament and moonlight right before flicking my finger at his forehead. Splat. S-P-L-U-R-K. Thud. And so the, great, Foul play Don Krieg's life came to an abrupt end as his headless body lay down onto the deck, pouring blood out to spread on the floorboards. Ah shit. Cursing myself for the oversight I turned and bowed to Zef who didn't look disturbed in the slightest about the execution, he just looked annoyed. Sorry about the floorboard, sir. I'll have it cleaned up. Turning to Usopp who gaped at the blood pouring out the body, a little green around the gills, I gave out my order. Usopp. Clean this up okay. Thanks. Internally I smirked hearing the shark-toothed protest and grumbles as he walked over and disposed of Krieg's body in the ocean before mopping the blood. Nami was undisturbed by the spectacle, only giving the headless body a glance before returning to her appraisal of the loot. Sanji didn't comment on it either, in favor of pulling out another cancer stick to smoke. Patty and Carne stared for a few seconds before shrugging it off and going over to Zef to ask if he needed anything done about the rest of the crooks still on board. Of course the relative silence wasn't kept up for long as the Bharati cooks who were just normal civilians without any background in piracy began screaming in fear, the Krieg pirates adding to the noise but with more horror, disbelief and anger over their captain's death. Jin stared blankly at the blood Usopp was mopping off the floor, 
the only evidence of Creed's swift death, before gulping nervously and returning to his kowtow position, trembling more than ever waiting for my response. He didn't even lash out on his crewmates this time as most of them actually joined him in taking the submissive posture, wordlessly begging for their worthless lives to continue. Thoughts, Wolf? Leave Jin alive. Oh, just Jin? Always leave at least one alive, pup. I scrunched up my face at that, not really getting why. Why do you think I made no mention of Django's escape back on Syrup? Ah, so you did notice the rat getting away. If there's a reason to let one live, why let Alvita's crew, and buggies for that matter, all live, only sporting bruises? Those were all your choices. You never asked for my input or thoughts on them. Hmm, well you're not wrong, so mind telling me why I should let only one live. One must always leave one man alive, to begin the legend, to spread the tale. The wolf bastard was grinning sadistically as he said all this. That's your excuse for doing it, you want to leave broken husks of victims, too broken to fight for anything but unwilling to end themselves, that's why you singled out Jin, he'll break, he'll likely never pick up a blade again as well, but he'll live to spread my name and my infamy. I confess to doing this for my twisted cathartic pleasure, but it does serve a purpose, spreading your name and infamy, you've even figured out why I singled out Jin. Yeah, I have, erupting my hands into black flames, I shaved past every other Creed pirate on the ship, cutting through them with my long clawed hands before returning to stand in front of Jin as if nothing had happened. For a moment it seemed nothing did happen, I just vanished then returned, at least, that's how it looked to everyone except my crew and Zeph. We leave one alive, one who wouldn't off themselves afterwards and carry on to spread the legends in every tavern they enter, everyone and anyone who'd give them the time of day to listen. We do this to spread our name, pup, we leave one alive because. Only you know everything that happened here, Jin. The vice captain raised his head to look at me with confusion, not understanding the meaning behind the statement. His face was very telling, his thoughts were probably, was I letting him go, so he could spread my infamy? Or was I saying I'd kill him as well so I'd remain away from the marine's radar for a while longer? Jin got his answer when one by one his comrades began bursting into black flames and screaming in pain. They rolled around the deck but the flames never went out, and didn't even seem to harm or damage the ship in any way. Some jumped overboard and into the ocean but still they burned, and burned, until only ashes remained. W.Y. We surrendered, we didn't want to fight anymore, why only me? Jin's face twisted in rage as he turned back to me with angry tears cascading down his face. Why leave me alive? Because only you know everything that happened here, only you can spread what happened here today, what will continue to happen to anyone else who crosses us, the smirk of twisted delight on my face froze the man kneeling before me, the fear and despair setting in. He was the last of his crew, and he would be the one to deliver the message. We leave one alive Jin, at least one, after all. Jin shook where he kneeled, absolutely terrified as I placed my hand on his shoulder like we were old buddies catching up. I kneeled down to his level as well and brought my lips to his ears, concentrating a little bit of moonlight and conquerors into my voice for the clincher. Dead men tell no tales. No one's pov. The concentrated blast of Conqueror's hockey mixed with moonlight knocked the last Creed pirate out cold, his body limply crashing down into the deck. Luffy looked down at the man for a few moments before fishing out a pouch of gold from his pocket. Get him a raft, a map, a compass and about a month's worth of provisions. Luffy tossed the pouch over to Patty who fumbled a bit to catch it. The disproportionate cook didn't look pleased about having to do something for the Creed pirate but with one look into the amount in the pouch, he was back to his creepy patronizing smiles. Right away, ya crook. Patty jovially stated before running off to carry out the command. Luffy was quiet for a moment longer watching the Bharati cooks getting over their shock and horror enough to return into the restaurant, partly to get back to work and partly to get away from Luffy. The wolfman then turned to his fiancé, so how much more hell am I gonna have to put Usopp through? Behind Luffy, Usopp flinched as he stood straight as a pillar before turning to Nami with pleading eyes. The navigator's sweet smile did not put him at ease. Since Sanji will be joining us, I think private sessions with both him and Zoro should help. Nami answered moving to sling the bag of loot over her shoulder only for Luffy to do it for her. I can carry that, you know. Yeah, do you want to? Luffy inquired moving to drop the bag back down but stopped with a smirk as Nami shook her head as she planted a kiss on his cheek. Nah, you already got it. Nami looked pleased for a moment before she gave Luffy a cold look. And next time you want to test Usopp, don't drag me into it. No pro me yes dear. Luffy chuckled, shivering slightly under Nami's withering glare and Usopp's depressed form underneath a miniature rain cloud. Yeah I'm not questioning that. Luffy decided figuring trying to make sense of the creation of such phenomena that make things more dramatic were more hassle than they were worth. Usopp, since you came out of the restaurant you must have passed him. Usopp's overdramatic display came to an abrupt halt as the marksman coughed into a closed fist before standing up and dusting himself off. Yeah, he's in there, he really your uncle, Luffy? Yeah, I lost my cool back there when Zoro fell. Didn't even bother checking on how Mahawk ended their duel, just jumped and attacked. Luffy smiled wryly, evidently still disappointed in himself before he sighed. All right, let's head in. Let those two have their moment. Luffy, Nami and Usopp quietly made their way into the restaurant leaving Zeph and Sanji to themselves, the pair of chefs having made their way to a railing and seemed to be having their final goodbyes. Inside the restaurant, on a window side table, sat Mahawk. The swordsman had a clear view of the whole spectacle as he had a dish similar to the one Luffy had when he'd first arrived. 
A fragrant, tender, juicy filet mignon, medium rare, served with aromatic sautéed vegetables and light fluffy mashed potatoes paired with a glass of wine, from a bottle similar to the one Luffy received from Zeph when they first met. Quite the execution. Mahawk commented, a sake cup in his hands. Come, we have much to discuss, nephew. Luffy took the offer and sat opposite of Mahawk, pouring a cup of sake for himself when the older man gestured to the bottle. Nami and Usopp both stood a bit behind Luffy, unsure of what they should do. Did they stand behind him like bodyguards or sit with him? Usopp, go order us some lunch, to go. Order some for Johnny and Yosaku as well. I assume they're still on the ship watching over Zoro? Usopp nodded to Luffy's question before saluting, Luffy's eye twitched at that, and walked off to perform his task. Nami squirmed and fidgeted nervously, now the only one under Mahawk's intimidating gaze. Nami, take a seat, join us. The navigator looked like she wanted to protest but resigned with her fate with a nervous gulp when Mahawk poured sake into another cup and placed it near the seat next to Luffy. The navigator took a seat and mentally scolded herself, get a grip, Nami. This isn't you. You're a beautiful, confident, young woman who's stolen from more pirates than anyone else in the East Blue. No reason to be nervous before your fiancé's uncle, not at all, right? While Nami was having a mental breakdown, too distressed to notice Luffy and Mahawk's amused expressions, her boyfriend decided to get the ball rolling. You know about the Silver Flame. Shanks told me all about it, your devil fruit and its true history with the Void Century. Mahawk answered still with an amused smirk as Nami looked up from her internal debate with curiosity. Doesn't seem you've filled my niece to be in on the full story. Nami flushed briefly before she pouted at me. To be honest I only know what Lil Shanks told me about before he returned to the Grand Line. From there I explained it as I knew it. The previous users of my devil fruit were known to become kings or emperors with powers that made them nigh on unbeatable, typically being usurpers and enemies of governments with the exception of the last known user. The last one hadn't usurped any kingdom and neither was he one to pick a fight with the government, of course the government didn't see it that way and didn't want to take any chances. Unfortunately for them, the last user was affiliated with, the Great Kingdom, and virtually untouchable, at least until the kingdom's fall to the Alliance. After the fall, the previous user had secluded himself far from the reaches of the Alliance, what would go one to become the world government, and died presumably of old age. The fruit gave immense power that made one nigh on invincible but it wasn't one that granted immortality, a fact that I was honestly happy with. You're not interested in immortality? Nami asked, her voice containing genuine curiosity, devoid of judgment. What would be the point? I live forever while those I love crumble to dust. Even just thinking about such a fate sent shivers down my spine, to be immortal meant losing everything, everyone. I had no desires for such a cursed existence. Smart choice. Mahawk said before he pulled out a sheathed blade, a cutlass. It had a yellow hilt with a diamond-shaped pattern, a golden guard and a thinner handguard running atop the hilt. Nami didn't give much thought to the simple if not elegant-looking blade at first but Luffy's reaction made her curiosity soar. Shanks had made a stop at the South Blue a few months back, came across this one when he went to pay his respects in Batterla. Luffy didn't make any comment, his form trembling ever since a sheathed blade was brought out and placed before him. Nami was beginning to be concerned with his behavior however and broke him out of his stupor. Luffy? What's wrong? She asked, placing a hand on his shoulder while gazing worryingly at him. You look, frazzled. What's special about? This is. Luffy gulped nervously as he unsheathed the blade and admired the saw hammond pattern adorned on its sides. The blade of. Now it was Nami's turn to be speechless as her eyes widened into saucers, looking at the seemingly simple cutlass in a new light. Shanks wanted you to have it, or at least for you to decide if either you or that hot-headed brother of yours should. Mahawk explained, taking a sip from his drink before commenting further. Of the three of you I believe, Sabo could use it best in terms of technical skill though. But only Ace and I could ever wield it like he did. Luffy supplied before blinking rapidly and taking his eyes off the sword to focus them on Mahawk. Wait how do you? Shanks is as bad as Yasip when he talks about you. Mahawk answered before Luffy could even finish, the response causing the wolfman to blush in embarrassment, much to his girlfriend's mirth. He learned about Ace and Sabo when the former tracked him down to thank him for all he did for you. After that, the next time I had drinks with him, Shanks talked my ear off about the new stories he got about you. Oh dear lord above, strike me down. Luffy groaned as he placed his head in his hands to hide in shame. Nami and Mahawk shared a laugh at the wolfman's expense. The tense mood between the two gone. Well Nami's tense mood, Mahawk couldn't care less about judging or critiquing who Luffy was dating. So, this blade is mine now. Luffy sheathed the blade again as Mahawk smirked wryly before responding. Naturally. Shanks must have drank a bit too much if he ever believed Ace would accept that blade. Luffy and Mahawk chuckled, knowing how ridiculous such a hope would be. Nami was puzzled. She knew Ace and Sabo from the stories Luffy would share with her in their bedroom but there wasn't anything about him that indicated not accepting the blade. Luffy noticed her questioning glance and promised he'd explain later in private. This is for that archer of yours. His father had some ideas for a weapon or tool for him to pick up and learn. Mahawk brought out a wrapped package and placed it on the table. Many tall tales have apparently made their way into the grand line about a, a, uh, long-nosed liar. The three all smirked as Usopp blushed in embarrassment stumbling in his walk to the ship when he overheard that little tidbit. Sanji, who'd been walking behind him, glared down at the marksman who he'd ended up bumping into. So what's dad been up to these days? Luffy inquired as he took a sip out of his sake. Nami quietly drank her sake beside him, not having any questions and content with just listening. 
Aside from the occasional mention of drinking taverns out of business he hasn't been seen in any news lately. Under the table, he's been very active actually. Mahawk's light mood was dropped as they delved into more serious matters. Merry as he is, your father has been busy hunting down a certain man, one whose actions have earned not only Shanks ire but Whitebeard's as well. Whitebeard? What did this guy do to get Whitebeard and Shanks on his case? Luffy knew the two of them to be jovial individuals, Whitebeard obviously less so but still he wasn't the kind of guy to hold a grudge unless, did this jackass attack one of Whitebeard's sons? Mahawk observed Luffy for a moment, wondering if telling the young man about this was a mistake, no, with his brother also out on the hunt it's best he be aware of the situation, maybe smack some sense into the hothead if they cross paths. Marshal D. Teach, former member of the Whitebeard Pirates, defected after attacking and supposedly killing one of his crewmates for a devil fruit. Shatter. The glass in Luffy's hand broke into pieces and some sake mixed with blood dripped from his hand. Nami reprimanded him for his action but Luffy was too livid to care, the wolf within siding with him on this matter. He attacked one of his own. For a devil fruit, a very powerful logia type, one that like yours would make the user a near perfect counter for any other devil fruit user. Mahawk sighed internally. Luffy may be Shanks' adopted son and carries many of the carefree man's ideologies but when it came to pirate crews he was almost exactly like Whitebeard. You would likely be the sole exception to that. Luffy, while absolutely furious about someone turning on their own, took in his uncle's words seriously. A logia that makes them the perfect counter to devil fruit users? There's only one logia it could be then. Greedy bastard turned on his brother for that fruit? It isn't even as invincible as it sounds. Nami still fussed over his bleeding hand while Mahawk leaned back against his chair, nodding to show he agreed with Luffy's words. It isn't in the grand scheme of things but it's still a very powerful fruit, and Marshal D. Teach isn't a brainless wannabe pirate Luffy. Mahawk gave Luffy a very pointed look, one that said to calm down now. The man acts like an aloof simpleton but he's not. He spent years on Whitebeard's ship for the chance of coming across that specific logia, he's crafty, intelligent and undoubtedly strong, even without the fruit. He's the one who gave Shanks the scar on his eye, Luffy. That piece of information gave Luffy pause. Shanks was a very powerful pirate, he was Yonko for God's sakes, and yet a crew member of the Whitebeard pirates had been able to leave a scar on him. So he isn't just another Krieg or buggy. No, he most certainly is not. I would advise against confronting him anytime soon, there are too many unknowns about him as of right now. Mahawk affirmed as he stood up, preparing to leave. While you would certainly come out on top, your crew would most certainly perish. Nami tensed and paused in her tending of Luffy's wounds at the reminder that as of now they were holding Luffy back. It seemed like she was going to have another self-deprecating episode but she recalled the level of individuals they were talking about her, seasoned New World Pirates having their way with East Blue Rookies. It was a no-brainer when you thought about it, didn't make it any less frustrating though. Your brother is hunting him actually, Teach was under his division. Luffy stiffened before his eyes hardened, he knew Ace wouldn't let it go, and furthermore probably didn't even consider how royally fucked he was in the Devil Fruit matchup alone. Shanks asks you to knock some sense into him if you run into him, a request echoed by Whitebeard himself. Whitebeard knows me, Shanks and Edward are on good terms you know. They drink together occasionally and like I said, your father's as bad as Yasip. Mahawk chuckled as Luffy groaned at the reminder. Even without those, though I suspect Ace talks the old man's ear off about you anyway. Well, your social life in the new world before it could even begin. Shut up. Oh one more thing, Luffy. Mahawk reached into his pocket and brought out a black snail, private Den Den Mushi designed to not have its calls traced or tapped. You can use this to get into contact with Shanks and Garp, their numbers are already imprinted on it. With that Mahog made his way out of the restaurant Nami and Luffy stood up from the table and made their way to going merry, the wolfman locking the sheathed blade onto his belt and grabbing Yasop's package. The navigator was quiet, giving the wolfman reproachful looks, still miffed about how he hurt himself earlier but mostly she was lost in thought. The history of Luffy's devil fruit, the acquisition of the blade and who its previous wielder was, and the news about a threat lurking around in the Grand Line. We'll cross that bridge when we get there, Nami. Luffy slung an arm around Nami's shoulder, bringing his lover closer, giving her a kiss on the head. For now, we sail to Kokoyashi, and I fulfill my end of the bargain. Nami was silent for a moment longer before she gave Luffy a conflicted look, causing her captain to give her a questioning look. Don't tell me you're doubting my ability to deal with those fish sticks again? Nami shook her head rapidly at the incredulous notion. No, you'll make his death long and excruciating, I know that, I look forward to that. Nami responded with a twisted smile before frowning again. It's, there's one fish man I'd like to spare. This got Luffy's curiosity. One personality trait Luffy associated with his girlfriend was a deep hatred for all fishmen. A problem he planned on addressing on a later date. Looks like her hatred isn't as deep as I thought. Nami was able to guess what was going through her lover's mind and she scoffed. I know not all fishmen are evil, a lot of them are pricks sure. Luffy had a laugh at that, it was true after all. While many fishmen weren't monsters they were generally egotistical supremacists. It's the same thing with humans, some humans are good, some are evil, and some are just assholes, like Sanji. Luffy raised his brow in amusement, deciding to tackle the prejudice against Sanji first. Isn't Sanji a gentleman? He's an idiot who thinks more with his dick than his brain if he's facing a woman. Nami spat out venomously. Yes, I like guys like them when they're ones I plan on stealing from, but as a teammate? Hum, Sanji certainly does take his, chivalry, and, respect for women, to a new level, but it could be worse. 
Nami gave Luffy an unimpressed look. He could refuse to fight at all with women. Besides I'm pretty sure it's both a front to catch people off guard, and something about his past. Nami considered Luffy's words for a moment, it was certainly true from the tales Zeph had shared with them before during their many meals in the restaurant. While Sanji would explicitly not deal any bodily harm to women through battle he wasn't just gonna stand there and take a beating. He was also definitely aware of how ridiculous his code was, and even used its incredulousness to his advantage in dumbfounding the Creed pirates. Furthermore, if he did know how nonsensical his policy was but still kept it, it likely did stem from a past trauma. Still don't like it. Luffy laughed at his girlfriend's childishness on the topic before moving to address the previous subject. So who am I sparing, and why? An octopus fishman, Hachi. Nami answered with a little fond smile that was accompanied with pained eyes. He isn't like the rest of Arlong's crew, actually gets along pretty well with the villagers. They don't cower in fear of him, I've even seen him having drinks and laughs with them when Arlong's not looking. Hachi sometimes even gives some money to the villagers who are struggling, and he tries alleviating Arlong's cruelty whenever he can. Luffy was smiling as he heard more about this strangely human-friendly fishman. I think he's just stuck to Arlong because that's how he's lived most of his life, like the sweet friendly kid who ends up following the school bully around because he wouldn't get picked on. But he isn't able to stop Arlong completely, is he? Luffy inquired, a sad knowing smile on his face. No, he isn't. Hachi is honestly pretty weak compared to most of Arlong's crew. Nami admitted with a sad smile. Told me about his dream once, wanted to open a takoyaki shop on the seas to Fishman Island. Hachi is the only one who wasn't cruel to me, he brought me drinks and books sometimes, he just can't go against Arlong. Any other characteristics aside from Octopus Fishman? Well, he's the only Octopus Fishman of the Arlong Pirates, Nami contemplated what other features Hachi had before she snapped her fingers. Oh he does have this red sun tattoo in between his eyes. Arlong and a few others of his crew have it as well but it's on their chest areas, Luffy? Nami turned to her boyfriend questioningly as the wolfman's eyes bugged wide open. A red sun? You're sure? Luffy separated from Nami's side to clutch her shoulders tightly. Nami winced and Luffy let go, ah, sorry I. No, it's fine Luffy, more importantly, what's important about the red sun tattoo? Nami never asked Hachi about it or any of the other Arlong pirates that bore the mark, but with the way Luffy's attitude changed she was starting to think she should have. The red sun is the symbol of the sun pirates, a pirate group led by the warlord, Jinbei, the knight of the sea. Luffy explained to Nami but his eyes were filled with confusion. But that's not possible, Arlong has this mark as well? The red sun? Yeah, why is this not making sense, exactly? Is it Arlong being here instead of the grand line with this, Jinbei? The problem? Nami had heard the name of the fishman warlord being tossed around during her time as a thief but she never gave it much thought, she doesn't even know what he looks like. Nami, Jinbei became a warlord in order to push for fishman human equality, something his crew avidly supports him in doing, except, Luffy's eyes widened remembering one of the details his grandpa told him about the warlord, except his brother. Nami's own eyes widened in disbelief, her home was under the rule of a tyrant who was the brother of a warlord. Is that why the marines didn't do anything, her small village being a small price to pay? Was this their definition of fishman human equality? Let the monsters like Arlong have their way with the lower classes of humanity? The navigator was filled with unchained fury at the notion. Luffy on the other hand just burst in laughter causing Nami to stare at him in confusion and a little pain. What was her suffering amusing? She had no illusions that her boyfriend had rather twisted tendencies but this. No, no, that isn't Luffy. Nami reprimanded herself while Luffy breathed in and out deeply. To his enemies maybe but not to his friends, not to his family, not to me. Nami, what marine base is in charge of your village? Luffy had a shit-eating grin on his face before he took in his girlfriend's upset appearance and frowned. Oh, that was insensitive of me, I'm sorry Nami. Forget it, you probably figured something out so spill it. Nami waved off Luffy's apology, knowing him well enough to deduce he was just being an impulsive moron again. And it's the 16th branch in the East Blue, what does that have to do with your mirth over this? Luffy had no qualms with gracing his face in a twisted smile. My love, Jimbei is a fishman of his word. He pushes for fishman human equality and yet his former subordinate, his brother no less, goes into something as atrocious as this. Luffy's manic grin was enhanced by the sadistic light in his eyes. A brother he freed from impel down with one condition, never harm innocent humans or I'll put you down myself. Nami wasn't sure what to do with that, before she realized something. Arlong had been in the Konami Islands for eight years and yet the warlord hadn't done anything to keep his promise. There were two possible reasons for that. Either Jinbei wasn't the fishman of his word that Luffy confidently says him to be, or the marine base in charge of the Konami Islands were in league with Arlong and making sure word of his exploits remained in the East Blue where Jinbei wouldn't hear of them. My grandfather vouches for Jinbei being a noble individual Nami, and you know Gramps' reputation for his assessment of people. Oh she did, that made the fury she felt come crashing back like a tsunami. You're telling me the marines, the ones meant to protect civilians, have let that 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 monster reign on my hometown willingly? Nami was livid, absolutely and unequivocally livid but Luffy's sadistic mirth didn't diminish in the slightest. Love, I have a proposal for you. Luffy placed his hands on his queen's thighs as he lifted her up to stare up at her with the most sadistic, twisted look in his eyes that Nami had ever seen. At first his eyes disturbed her but as she listened more and more to his proposal, oh was she beginning to love that look. 
By the end of it, the wolf's queen shared the same twisted light in her own eyes as she agreed with his, modifications to their agreement enthusiastically. Sanji's pav, so, a pirate's life for me, eh, I'm used to myself as I followed Usopp to the going merry, my new home away from home. Not that that place was ever actually a home. The two bounty hunters were above deck to greet us, the crazy swordsman was in the men's barracks recovering soundly, apparently. Usopp carried the lunches towards the kitchen after he pointed me in the direction of the men's barracks. I gave him my thanks before walking off to drop my luggage over, after that I would be able to see what kind of workshop I'd be having on this ship. Most likely just the essentials. It wasn't particularly a big problem if the kitchen had only the bare essentials at the moment. There would be plenty of opportunities to purchase more utensils for other dishes later. Inside the barracks, on one of the hammocks far inside slept the green-haired alcoholic nutbag himself. The hammock directly to his side was cluttered with gears, wires, and tools. So Usopp's also a tinkerer. Setting my stuff on the hammock right by the door, directly next to a window, I kept my eyes on the swordsman. Zoro, a little longer before walking out the barracks. On the way out I could see Twiddle D and Twiddle Dum murmuring amongst each other as they peeked over the ship. Curious, I went over to check out what caught their interest and upon learning what it was, well those two know better than to spy on a couple having intimate moments from now on. Bro cook, why? What did we even do? Okay, maybe not. Instead of explaining however I just sighed disappointedly at them before continuing on my way to the kitchen. Once I got in, I waved to Yusop in greeting while the archer offered a hello before going back to setting the table. Well he has been here longer than I have. Usopp, could you tell me about your journey so far? While keeping an ear open to listen to the tale, I set about making a little something for my injured comrade. How do you meet Luffy and the others? Hum, oh well you see, I the great, the truth please, I'd like to know what my new family is genuinely like. Usopp deflated a little at being cut off before rubbing his nose with a sheepish chuckle. Ha 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 ha, gotcha, okay, so to be honest I'm actually. Long story short, Usopp was the third to be recruited into Luffy's crew, in the island just before they made their way here. On that island, Luffy, Nami and Zoro had come looking for him because he was the son of Yasip, the sniper of the Red Hair Pirates, technically making him Luffy's cousin. After a rocky introduction Usopp and Luffy had really hit it off and Usopp even introduced him to his best friend, a woman named Kaya. Upon hearing that I'd crushed the lemon in my hand with an excessive amount of force causing it to explode, Usopp gave me a startled look but I just went on pretending nothing had happened. TCH. This guy has a girlfriend too. Deciding to drop the sudden display of aggression, wise choice, Usopp then told the tale of Plahador an ex-pirate captain turned butler with the alias Kuro. The story was one that put me on edge. A sick, cowardly, pathetic bastard running away from the pirate's life and plotting to take the life of an innocent girl he'd cared for, for years just so he could live the easy life. I should pay that bastard a visit myself. I'd voiced my desire to do so to Usopp but the marksman said Plahador had vanished after the battle with Luffy. Neither Luffy or Zoro had said what became of Plahador, only that he would never trouble anyone again. The marksman confessed that he believed Clahador was most likely dead, if Luffy had no qualms executing Krieg like that I don't think he'd done any differently with Clahador, or well maybe he did worse. I raised my eyebrow in question, gesturing for the archer to explain what he meant by that. Ah well you see, there's this thing called hockey, Usopp then gave me a brief crash course on hockey and basically with the use of observation hockey he'd been able to hear while Luffy had muttered to himself right before he blew Krieg's head off. All right, you're not even worth torturing, is what Luffy said, he probably made Clahador's last moments in this world very unpleasant. That's a mild way of putting it. I eyed the concoction in my hands with a glare. It wouldn't taste good, that wasn't the point of it. It was a homemade remedy meant to give someone a buttload of essential vitamins and minerals, flavor wasn't an important factor for it. It isn't horrible, but it certainly isn't pleasant, I sighed briefly before my eyes landed on a certain beverage on the far corner of the room. Single quote dot dot dot. Well, it does dull the pain. Yeah, Luffy can be brutal. Usopp confirmed with a pained laugh as he touched his sides. Just wait till you join training, actually never mind. I saw you kick away that miniature warship like it was a soccer ball, you'll probably thrive. I wanted to question him about that but Usopp immediately jumped into profiling Luffy, Nami and Nutjob. Luffy was a wolf, in every sense of the word, fiercely loyal to his family and friends and had absolutely no mercy for his enemies. Nami was greed incarnate apparently, though I get the feeling it may be exaggerated slightly because of the incident earlier with her, betrayal. Nutjob was a battle junkie but kind of like the older brother of the group, keeping an eye on him. Usopp that is, and Nami while also doing his best to rein in Luffy from his random nonsensical impulsive urges. Apparently at one point in their journey Luffy had wanted to start an all-out paint war against a whole village because the place was too quiet, what kind of idiot did I just make my captain? Ha 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 ha, yeah Luffy can give you whiplash for days with how inconsistent he can be. Usopp was incredibly amused at the moment since in hindsight it was kind of funny, but in the moment it was just, what the fuck? Sometimes he's cool, calm and calculating, the next, he's a great among the brain. What have you been making anyway? Usopp inquired as he eyed the beverage in my hands curiously. A drink for the nut job. I responded coolly before I made my way out the kitchen with the concoction and a plate of food, smirking hearing Usopp's response. Which one? He asked mirthfully. Hey, guess it could have been referring to Luffy or one of the bounty hunters. Walking by the deck I saw Luffy and Nami blinking with confusion at the two crumpled bounty hunters who sported bumps and bruises all around their faces. 
They were eavesdropping on her private moments I kicked their asses a bit. Luffy smirked with mirthful eyes while Nami smiled darkly before pulling out a collapsible staff with blunt circular ends that promised one hell of a concussion. Usopp said the takeout on the dining table already. I'll join you guys for lunch after I get Zoro his lunch and this remedy for pain relief. While I turned away, not bothering to wait for Luffy's reaction, there was no point in waiting for Nami's since the beautiful maiden was more occupied with beating the living crap out of Johnny and Yosaku, I knew my captain was sporting an approving grin. Back inside the men's barracks, I walked over to Zoro's hammock, eyeing the only blade to have survived the duel with Mahawk, being clutched like a teddy bear. Yeah I am not touching that subject. What do you want, cook? Zoro grumbled out, cracking one eye open to look at me. The guy wasn't all there yet but he was somehow rested enough to wake up and strike a conversation. What the heck is that? Something that'll help you recover a little better. I answered coolly, handing him the home remedy. It won't speed up the process, I'm a cook not a miracle worker, but it will give you all the essential nutrients you'll need and some relief from the pain. The swordsman just stared at me blankly for a moment before he shifted on his bed so he was sitting up and then he took the meal and the drink, thanks. Don't mention it, we're crewmates now and I'm the cook. It's in the job description to keep the crew full and healthy, even if it is a nut job. Zoro glared at me but while others cowered under that glare I just responded in kind. There were intimidating humans that looked like monsters and then there were real monsters. Zoro was just human. Why do you duel Mahawk? You knew you wouldn't win. The best teacher is experience. My uncovered eye twitched at the response. This fucker really was the definition of battle junkie. It was also a measure. A measure? On how much farther I have yet to go. I scoffed at that. I could tell you that much without you having to get your ass beaten, Moss Head. You trying to start something, dark bro? Zoro's patience was running thin. Good, he'll be easy to rile up for stress relief. The smirk that came to my face as well as the relaxation of my tense body gave the shitty swordsman pause before he gave me a, you gotta be kidding me, face. Luffy put you up to this, to distract me from moody feelings and stuff like that? Not exactly. He gave me permission to start fights with you and to treat them as extended training. Zoro was silent for a moment before he eyed me up, then he grinned. Hey, try to keep up, Arrow Cook. Please, I'll be running circles around you, shitty Merrimo. If you two are done, Zoro and I both turned to the entrance of the men's barracks to see Luffy leaning against the door frame with an amused smile. You can get back to your sibling rivalry later, I need to have a word with Zoro. The swordsman beside me stiffened upon being called out and moved to get off the hammock but Luffy was suddenly right next to us. What the? I backed away slightly from the two before darting my eyes back to the entrance where Nami was now standing in front of, gesturing for me to come with her. I gave Luffy and Zoro another glance, the two seeming to have a silent exchange, before I walked out the room. It's called Shave, by the way. Nami said as we walked towards the kitchen, Johnny and Yosaku passed out on the deck black and blue. Luffy's seemingly instantaneous movement from one place to another. It's one of the six powers that all marines of the upper ranks are trained in. If it's training for marines how does Luffy know it? I inquired curiously as I opened the door for her, which she responded to with a smile. Luffy's the grandson of Monkey D. Garp, the hero of the marines. Luffy's 17 right now and he began training for the six powers seven years do the math. Ah, so Luffy's grandfather, Vice Admiral Garp, taught him how to use the six powers seven years ago. The six powers which were apparently only taught to higher ranked marine officers were taught to a 10 year old, wait, a 10 year old? Nami laughed seeing the realization and dawning horror on my face while Usopp just stared at us in confusion, a rather large, highly detailed blueprint in his hand. The object depicted in the blueprint was reminiscent of a crossbow. Luffy's paw while Nami was relieving her stress by being Johnny and Yosaku to a pulp and Sanji went to deliver Zoro his lunch, I walked to the kitchen to give Usopp the package. The package actually had some weight to it but it was also too big to just be a stack of blueprints and letters. You sure about that? This is Yasip, for all you know it could actually be just letters. You're right, who am I kidding? This is motherfucking Yasip we're talking about. It would be weirder if it wasn't just a stack of letters and maybe one or two blueprints. Hey Luffy, what you got over there? Yusuf asked as he took a seat on the dining table, waiting for the rest of us before digging in. This is a package from your father. Mahawk was asked to deliver it to you along with, well my father's gift to me. I gestured to the new blade I had at my side before placing the package on the table in front of him. Mahawk mentioned some blueprints your father included in there for weapon or tool inspirations. Most of M's probably letters though. Luffy, I, geez, the guy was tearing up as he held the package like it was the first plate of food he'd had in weeks. I get it, you love your dad but, the level of these waterworks man. I chuckled and ruffled his hair a bit before I turned to walk away, leaving the marksman to feebly complain about being treated like a kid. Outside Nami was still beating the two snoopers up. I paused a bit as Johnny shot me a pleading look, begging for a rescue. It was tempting honestly, Nami had made them black and blue with bumps sprouting all over. Then I took a peek at my lovely fiancé who looked as bloodthirsty and terrifying as she was beautiful, and left the two to their fate. Coward. You want to get in the middle of that? That shut the hypocritical bastard up. Mythical magical damn near all-powerful wolf or not, unhappy wife, unhappy life. Opening the door to the men's barracks I was left smiling as I watched a recreation of one of the most familiar sights back on Don Island. Dye Zoro's hair black then you've basically got Sabo and Ace bickering as they always do. You know, now that I think about it, aren't these two eerily similar to your brothers? Not completely of course but, still lots of things are uncannily similar. The wolf was right. Sanji was Sabo, 
the smart blonde with an air of responsibility and maturity to him, long as women weren't involved anyway in Zoro. Holy shit. Zoro's just a calmer, more toned down ace. Battle junkie. Check. Violence is the answer. Check. Almost entirely instinct driven. Check. Angry at the world? Okay, maybe not. Narcolepsy? Zoro did mention sleep being his default pastime if he wasn't training. Shaking my head, I decided to put an end to their bickering. If Ace and Sabo were any indicator, these two numbskulls would be at this until dinner. If you two are done getting their attention off each other and on me, I continued. You can get back to your sibling rivalry later. I need to have a word with Zoro. Zoro stiffened momentarily before moving to get off the hammock. I wasn't about to let him do that in his state, so I shaved over to his side and pushed him back down, ignoring Sanji's shock. My swordsman eyed me up, gauging my body posture if he was in any trouble. Similarly, I gauged him up but for the purpose of surveying the damage. Neither one of us spoke until Sanji walked out the room and joined Nami on the way to the kitchen. You're not in trouble, Zoro. I got the ball rolling by assuring my first mate of that fact. Thankfully, Zoro immediately relaxed and leaned against his hammock again, shifting his plate to his lap but not eating yet. I wanted to talk to you about this. Unsheathing my blade, I watched as Zoro's eyes widened upon seeing it. There wasn't any recognition in his eyes though, just disbelief. What the? WH where did you find a blade like? My father requested Mahak to deliver this to me. This is why he came looking for me in the East Blue in the first place aside from grabbing a bite to eat in the Bharati anyway. I swallowed anxiously before proceeding on with the specifics about this blade. This blade is, and was the blade of. This was the first of many shocks Zoro received that night, many more followed as I shared with him my family's history as well as the blades. Throughout it all Zoro was quiet, nodding along from time to time to show he understood or was still paying attention. By the end of it, Zoro was deep in thought, his eyes closed. So you want me to be your mentor? In swordsmanship? Zoro finally inquired, still not opening his eyes. Yes. I want no one else. I answered back without hesitation. Zoro's head snapped up and his eyes opened in shock and confusion. Why? Zoro asked incredulously. Don't get me wrong Luffy, I'm honored but, you saw my battle with Mahawk. I glanced downward at Zoro's hands tightening into shaking fists. I'm nowhere near the peak. I'm not even on Mahawk's level, how much more the blade's previous owner? I can't teach you. I drag you down, I'm not the world's greatest swordsman. I. Not to me. Zoro paused his self-deprecating tirade to see my cold glare as I loomed over him. You're not the world's greatest swordsman, but you are the greatest swordsman to me. He looked like he was lost for words. Good, I didn't need him to talk, I needed him to listen. You stood up and dueled Mahawk already knowing you wouldn't win but you did it anyway. You wanted to learn and you took the path with the most benefits and consequences without hesitation because you know experience is the best teacher. You know what you want to achieve and now you've gotten an idea of how to achieve it. But that isn't what made you the greatest swordsman in my eyes. Zoro's face was an impassive mask that gave no insight into his thoughts or emotions at the moment but his eyes burned with the desire to know why I saw him so. When it came down to it you didn't back away from your beliefs, your ideals. You didn't turn and run like so many others would already have done, you faced him and accepted defeat honorably, scars on the back are a swordsman's shame, right? Luffy, eat up and rest as much as you can, cause when you're able again. I turned back to face Zoro who I'd begun walking away from. We'll train each other till our hearts give out, my world's greatest swordsman. Drama Queen. Oh for, yes it was kind of overdramatic but sticking around and blankly staring at each other after a speech like that would just make me look stupid and negatively affect the impact okay? Still a drama queen. Son of a, why the hell have you been talking a lot more anyway? Aren't you supposed to be the reclusive, mysterious beast within and not a play-by-play -play sarcastic narcissistic commentator? Drama queen, the mental back and forth continued to rage on even when I took my seat at the head of the table and began eating lunch with my crew, minus the bounty hunter duo, after a toast to our newest addition, Sanji the cook. No one realized I was having a mental argument, aside from Nami of course. She took one glance at me before she sighed and kicked me in the foot with a glare telling both of us to stop. We wanted to argue back but, yeah no, we're not fighting that. Unhappy wife, unhappy life.